Take your seats, please. We'll be starting in about two, three minutes. You're from our ground. Debate 
that we'll all be having. And your input, whatever part of, of our lives that you've come from today, is your input and insights uh, to the presentations that are just as important because uh, they will influence skills and activity and the way that we go forward in the future. Now this is the second skills summit to be held in North Wales, the last one being in November. I can't believe it was November. It doesn't seem that long ago. Some of us were together for that. Uh, that, of course, was on the manufacturing sector and it was at College Cabaret at Deeside. Uh, so it seems appropriate to now develop and expand our focus on another of the key sectors for the region and for, in fact, for Wales as a whole and to concentrate on the energy sector. Now, before we get going, before you all start sharing our ideas and being excited by the people's presentations that are here, I just need to go through a few of the housekeeping points. Um, fire alarms, first of all. Uh, there's no test planned, uh, so if the alarm goes off, then please follow the instructions of the event staff uh, to make sure that we all get out of the building safely. And secondly, mobile phones, um, please could you turn them off? So right, with uh, that out of the way, we can move on, and I'd like to start by asking Williams, Chief Executive of our hosts here this morning, Ruth and uh, Van I, to provide a formal welcome for this event. Glyn. Very warm welcome to you this morning to Luca Rikamanai and to this conference. Um, I should just add a little bit to what Sarah said about the um, fire alarms. If you do hear the fire alarm, there is no practice intended. The exits are over there to the right and to the left, and the muster point is just outside here on the car park. Um, we're delighted to be the venue for this conference not least because the energy industry is a major priority for us as Group Temperature and I. Uh, and people do forget, of course, that in the excitement about Wilma Lewy and all the developments on Anglesey, that we have a long association with energy in this part of North Wales. There have been two nuclear power stations here for some years. Uh, we also have extensive hydroelectric en energy generation and also renewables, and you can't drive along the North Wales coast without seeing the extent of the Winter Moor facility out off the coast. But there is no mistaking, however, the massive impact, the challenge, the opportunity which Wilma Newid and the other energy initiatives in North Wales are going to provide. We should have given that we can be a plan in our plan for the some facts, uh, we are the biggest college in Wales, we were formed in 2012 as a result of a merger between the three colleges. We have some 27,000 students in total and recently we launched Business at Standard for Menai, which is dedicated to serving employers and to training the workforce here in North Wales. And perhaps the biggest example of that is a 12 million pound apprenticeship scheme, uh, which we lead in partnership with two private providers. And of course, energy, the energy sector, we regard <coughs> as our most important and biggest client. But I know as well that energy is also regarded by the Welsh Government as a major economic priority. And we've been working with them to shape our response to Wilma Newid and to the low carbon renewables sector which is developing so rapidly here in North West Wales. We've been waiting a long time for the economic bus here in North Wales and it seems as though they're all coming at once at the moment. Uh, the, the developments are uh, publicised on almost a weekly basis in, in the local press and it is very exciting um, for us certainly as a provider but also for the community and employers here in North Wales to be confronted with this challenge. And I know that the Welsh Government regards this as a very important priority, and I'm delighted here this morning to be able to introduce Dr Rachel Garside-Jones, 
uh, who is going to tell us a little bit about the government's approach and its response uh, to the energy developments. So, Rachel. arising from Wilbur Nerwith, which of course the, the Deputy Minister visited in February this year. Um, and today is a chance to discuss how key partners, employers, Welsh Government can support and, and discuss the skills needs of this project. On a smaller scale, but still very important, it was good to see the announcement last month that the Swedish company Minesto will be setting up its UK headquarters in Collyhead to continue development of low-velocity tidal generation devices. These developments, alongside other significant transformational projects, are part of a picture of a region which has many strengths, many opportunities, and this puts you in a very positive position for the future. I think opportunity is a key word here. Opportunities are only as good as the way they are exploited. And here in North Wales, um, as this summit shows, I think you've got the capability um, and the energy and commitment to build this lasting legacy to make the most of this for young and old, to reduce poverty and open up um, opportunities across your population. As a region, it's clear you have many assets. And the North Wales Economic Ambition Board, which the Welsh Government has worked with very closely and continues to do so, is strong, joined up and, and forward-looking. At the Wales Employment and Skills Board in November last year, we heard for the response from employers across Wales to your North Wales Regional Strategy and um, Employment and Skills Plan. And we had a very positive discussion about skills delivery and particularly about the collaborative approach that the Ambition and Board has developed to work with <coughs> supply chain and infrastructure projects. The work to connect skills delivery with supply chain development shows a holistic understanding of the potential of new energy initiatives and your inclusive work with the Mersey D Alliance to make the most of shared potential across the North West all said that you're approaching this opportunity in the right way. Now to talk a bit about Welsh Government and our role as partner um, and how we've invested and will continue to do so. We're glad to be invested in targeted skills with young people and importantly encouraging universities and colleges to think regionally and think about the supply of higher level skills for the future. You will not be surprised that when the Welsh Government published the review of higher education delivered by colleges in Wales last month, the recommendation included a push for stronger collaborative relationships between universities and colleges and an increase in the delivery of higher education within the college sector. We are keen that colleges and universities do more of this, to work together to develop sustainable ways of expanding the number of part-time higher education courses. You will probably also be aware that our Welsh Government consultation seeking views on the development of the apprenticeship model for Wales closed recently and the response has been really impressive. The vision is to design a new apprenticeship model that's held in high regard by employers, by individuals and by parents and a model importantly which is aligned with the needs of the Welsh economy. In terms of the energy sector specifically, um, the Welsh Government has provided considerable support for the sector. This includes backing for projects such as the Low Carbon and Marine Institute research, which was led by energy and utility skills. 
That project identified skills issues across all energy sectors and helped develop 30 new qualifications and new e-learning training programmes. 2.3 million has been invested to plan and design the capability to meet the skills needs of Energy Ireland and provide additional investment in energy related apprenticeships. And as And of course, we've invested five million in our host college today. Welsh Government is committed to making the regional skill delivery agenda work. We want to ensure that skills provision um, is responsive to and relevant to the economic opportunities in each region. And I know this is an aspiration we all share at the summit today. You will be aware of the Welsh Government Skills Implementation Plan, which was published in July last year. And in that plan, we put a strong focus on the skills that respond to regional need. With this as our aim, we endorse three regional skills partnerships across Wales and deputy minister this in October last year. And this includes the Economic Ambition Board's Employment and Skills Group, chaired by Ewan Trevor Jones. We invited regional employment and skills plans to be submitted by each of the partnerships in North, South, West and South East, which they all were by the target of the 31st of March. We've now assessed those plans, we've, we've given feedback to the partnerships and we're commissioning skills demanded supply assessments, which will be completed by the end of September this year. This will begin to give us the real detailed picture of where future skills investments must be focused. Our aim is that these assessments formally influence skills planning delivery from 2016, so this is a real opportunity for the region and for the North Wales plan to influence how we work in Welsh Government. Um, and I sense already, and we'll hear more about this today, that energy will feature large in this region and with the priorities of the plan. Another focus of the Skills Implementation Plan is our co-investment framework. We're working very closely with employers and key stakeholders on a revised approach to skills investment, which is needed if we're to have a sustainable skills system in Wales for the next decade. Our co-investment framework recognises the investment we made in skills by government employers and focuses action in three key areas. On influence, how we influence the investment decisions being made by employers and gov government. On investment, how we define investment principles which will drive how um, the future skills is, is funded and where. And impact, I think it's clear that we need to invest in those things that have most impact. Um, and how we link and evaluate those investment decisions against performance measures which we published last year, which will be very important in the future. The framework provides a strong foundation for shifting the emphasis to a framework for skills investment which is more influenced and led by employers. As Welsh government, we are investing in our schools, in our colleges, in our young people, and industry must invest too, and, and lots of employers in Wales are already doing this. We need you to work with the education system and provide work experiences which inspire young people, help them to understand the world of work, help them to understand the career pathways on offer. Ultimately, this also means rebalancing the responsibility for who pays for that training and, where appropriate, co-investment from employers. If Wales is to compete internationally, we cannot continue with the culture of skills investment which has such a reliance on public funding. This will all contribute to economic growth improve living standards and raising people out of poverty. I hope that this shows that the Skills Implementation Plan and the Welsh Government vision for employment and skills support which meets regional needs is aligned with what we want to achieve for North Wales. Just a few closing remarks as we look at North Wales and its energy sector. First, it's clear that the dynamics of this region have huge potential for the future. The companies, the positive culture, cross-border collaboration for the Mersey D Alliance are all powerful positives for North Wales. And the fact that we can come together in one room and have a summit such as this, I think is testament to the energy and commitment and what we can focus on today. When we add in major projects in the pipeline, other ones, you become the envy of other parts of Wales. And when also you think of the relationships between companies, schools, <coughs> colleges, local authorities, providers, universities, I think there's a real partnership approach here to strengthen skills and real potential for the energy sector to drive ahead, bringing more growth, more jobs, more wealth to North Wales. 
This summit is an excellent chance to discuss together how we can maximise the benefits of opportunities in front of us to create a long-term success story for the energy sector in North Wales and also indeed for the wider Welsh economy. I look forward today to participating in a productive summit. John Valian, thank you very much. which every person in this room probably has a role in fulfilling, whichever role you have in supporting the energy se sector here in this area, either directly or indirectly. I will be hearing your views after each of the two main sections that we have this morning uh, at this summit to explore how we can move together to, to really <coughs> enhance these goals and to reach those goals. We'll be essentially splitting the summit into two clear halves, if you like. We'll be looking at the demand side from the view of the employers, and then after a short coffee break, we'll be coming back to hear from the supply side, the providers within the education sector. But of course, before that, we need to start with some context. We need to understand the economic and the practical landscape, if you like, here in North Wales, the current situation and the trends. And by knowing that, then we can actually start looking at what we all need to do in our own ways to help move forward. What is it that makes North Wales different to other parts of Wales? How is the demand for skills changing? Is the skills system responding to the direction of the economy and its potential in the future? So that brings us to our next speaker, who will hopefully provide many of the answers. A bit of pressure there. Uh, Ewan Thomas is Regional Skills and Employment Coordinator for the North Wales Economic Ambition Board and works closely with Ewan Trevor Jones, who is the Chair of the Skills Steering Group of the Board, to collectively work alongside partners right across the region to support and develop a wider skills agenda. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ewan Thomas. <laughs> Good morning. I hope everyone can hear me um, at the far end of the room. Please wave if you can. Um, okay. In terms of, um, before we get to the main speakers this morning, it's worth just, as Sarah said, placing the context of where we are as a region in terms of the facts and figures, which may be quite dull for some, but it is essential as an evidence base for us as a region to understand our current climate in terms of the skills and labour market and also to understand where we're going in terms of the future and to harness those opportunities as best we can. So it is about supporting ambition with um, very much a play on words in the Economic Ambition Board because it is about a region of ambition um, and as we've already heard this morning there are many buses coming along all at once it feels and we have to make sure that we are ready to get on those buses and make sure that we're prepared. To give you just a couple of facts and figures really about North Wales on screen there are 28,000 businesses uh, currently registered within North Wales. But when we start to break that down and understand the landscape of the environment, 74% of those businesses employ less than five people, which shows the huge responsibility that we have in terms of supporting our micro-businesses and our SMEs across the region, because they are really the backbone of many of our communities, many of our counties, and of the region as a whole. When we look at the other side of those businesses in North Wales, we can see that only 5% within North Wales employ more than 20 people. Flintshire has the highest number of larger businesses, with 275 registered in 2014, followed by Wrexham with 210, and Gwynedd with 205. Going back to those businesses, those micro-businesses, those backbones of our communities, Gwynedd has the highest number of small businesses across North Wales with 3,715 businesses currently operational within the county with less than five people employed. This is followed by Flintshire with 3,265 businesses of a similar size and then Conway with 2,890.
when we look at the labour market generally, there are some interesting trends which are starting to emerge. One of the key headlines that is almost 3% more of the working population in North Wales now are self-employed compared to five years ago. So this shows that there is a positive appetite for people to set up business, for entrepreneurship, to be part of the supply chains, to take advantage of the wider, larger scale projects and the opportunities they possess. But it is our role as a region to make sure that we support those skills. We support the development of those skills, again, through our excellent education providers at all levels, from schools to FE to HE and to other training providers. When we look at the spirit of entrepreneurship in North Wales and supporting those skills, we can see that currently 15% of the working population in Gwynedd alone are self-employed. Anglesey comes second with 13% and then Wrexham follows with 8% and the other three counties are close behind. But in terms of the energy sector, as you've already heard and as you will continue to hear this morning, it is a region of opportunity from biomass to offshore, onshore wind, to solar to nuclear to hydro and others. North Wales is a major player in the energy sector within Wales and the UK. And the number of current and more crucially future projects within this diverse sector is testament to that. We also have an excellent, significant expert skills base within this sector, more than anywhere else in Wales, with a concentration of high level operational skills within the sector already based here. And the opportunities for expansion that many of the future projects will offer are considerable and need to be very much supported. One obvious example is the current 1,200 plus people who are currently still employed at both Trouseville and Wilva. These are people who have considerable high level skills within their applicable sector. And whilst acknowledging some will leave the world of work through natural retirement, who are currently employed on these two sites. How do we now as a region harness these skills to be put to use within the current labour market and supply chain within North Wales, with an eye on the future developments for which many of their current skill sets will be more than suited? It is also likely that within the energy sector here in North Wales, as new projects come online, be it in wind, solar, biomass, hydro, marine, we will see shifts in the current energy labour market as individuals look to further progress and develop their skills accordingly. Now this will create potential gaps and entry points for new skills, for new opportunities, which we need to harness, support and develop equally. An essential component of skills for us in North Wales in the energy sector is around STEM. Now the STEM subjects are absolutely critical to the future success of many of our projects, if not all of our projects within the sector, both current and future. Staff turnover within the energy sector has traditionally been quite low, but with an ageing workforce here within the sector across North Wales, we could shortly be facing a skills shortage across a number of areas within the energy sector if we do not act now. The promotion of STEM subjects within the education sector is a key component to generating the next wave of the labour supply for the energy sector here in North Wales. Skills deficiencies in some areas of the energy sector in North Wales have meant companies have had to lower their job requirements and provide on-the-job training. This approach could, if not careful, result in potential consequences for productivity and issues around the quality of the training itself. The Welsh Government's National Strategic Skills Audit has shown that across the Welsh economy as a whole, jobs which require STEM-specific skills have a high percentage of skills gaps, and we're seeing that already within some sectors of the energy sector here in North Wales. Particularly for associate professionals, we're looking at about 76% where there are skills gaps. Skilled trades, we're looking at about 66% where there are small to medium scale skills gaps. And also for those who are machine operatives across the energy sector. Of these STEM skills gaps, one quarter were thought to be the result of people not receiving the appropriate training in the first instance. And one in five because of the introduction of new technology for which some of them were feeling left behind. <coughs> Whilst there is now an increasing focus within North Wales on STEM activities, the majority of these are not sustainable and sufficient to meet long-term aspirations if we don't act collectively now. A study just completed by the North Wales Economic Ambition Board and its partners, including the region wider project Careers Wales and others within the energy sector, showed that across the six counties here in North Wales, 67% of STEM activities in our schools were a one-off type of activity. 
Our study has also revealed that within the research that the demand for STEM graduates and postgraduates will increase much faster than any other subjects by 2017, 2018. And we estimate that the demand for engineering graduates will potentially rise by an estimated 56% in North Wales. For mathematical science graduates, it will almost double its current levels. And for physical environment science graduates, our study here by the Ambition Board has estimated an increase of 48% demand within North Wales. The report that I referred to has just been completed by partners and will be published in the next couple of weeks. And again, its recommendations will be clear and transparent for all to see in terms of what we as a region collectively do in terms of taking that forward. So moving on to the future skills needs for us in North Wales for the energy sector. Um, there were several skills needs identified um, at the planning and development stages of developing a project that will generate energy. And for us, it's not just about what type of energy it is, where the site is, or to some degree its size and scale. All energy projects share many commonalities at a more professional level of skills at this planning and development stage. This includes skills around environmental awareness, planning, surveying of the potential site, and specific legal and planning issues to carry out the necessary site surveys. All skills which we again need to support and harness within North Wales. In terms of construction, this is where we see the peak in terms of skills, demands and needs. And again, we will see a significant peak across North Wales in the coming years. But in terms of the employment opportunities, albeit on a fixed term basis, we also need to see a greater appreciation of the subtle safe, uh, difference in terms of behaviour differences between other construction sites and those which are specific to the energy sector. <coughs> the range of energy projects across the region, while sharing a common baseline of skills, needs within the construction phase, will also see additional specialisms unique to each branch of the energy sector. And our challenge, our challenge here in North Wales, is to work with the developers, to work with employers, to identify as early on as possible what those specific skills needed are and to help the developer deliver those skills here within North Wales. The final part of that kind of pipeline there in terms of the future skills needs in terms of the operational phase. And it's during this phase that we will see a demand for jobs, albeit smaller in volume than the construction phase, yet for a wide range of staff with different skill sets, ranging from highly skilled posts operating the energy facilities here in the region, to support staff in various disciplines from site security, catering, administration, transport, finance, etc. Learning from previous and current projects should help us identify the range of skills required for future projects. But it is developing and maintaining the close working relationship with the developers and the employers, which is absolutely key to help address these skills demands to support our providers, our colleges, our universities and our schools in the North Wales to gain that information sooner rather than later to help them inform their curriculum and make sure that they can develop and deliver these skills. Now construction is one of the key areas for us in North Wales as an offshoot of the energy sector and it's what I always call the ripple effect. It's not just construction in North Wales that will benefit from the major projects within the energy sector in North Wales. As you can see from the aptly titled Ripple Effect, you can see on screen, which I'm quite proud of. Um, <laughs> as you can see, it's not just the energy sector, not just construction. We will see the ripple effect extended to many of our supply chains across North Wales, which in turn will require some, uh, some support in terms of skills. We're looking at manufacturing, we're looking at the transport sector, the accommodation sector across North Wales, food and drink, Leisure, all of these construction workers, as they move across our region, will require all of these services and more. And again, we have to be prepared to support the skills within each of these sectors in addition to the main focus within the energy sector. But it is construction which potentially could be the big winner, as it were, in terms of working on the energy sector projects. And it's worthwhile noting in terms of the construction businesses that currently operate in North Wales. And these are the figures taken from the North Wales Economic Observatory, which is an observatory which is supported by the Ambition Board and is free to use for anyone to access. But it's worth noting in terms of the size, in terms of businesses that we have in construction across North Wales, ranging from 315 construction companies registered in Anglesey, to 575 in Gwynedd, to 595 in Flintshire, and 480 in Wrexham. 
Our construction sector is going to be key and critical to supporting these energy projects as they develop and as they take shape within North Wales. But in terms of have we got the capacity, that is the question. If people move, and we will see a movement of labour within the uh, construction industry as people go for these um, kind of high ticket jobs as it were, what happens in terms of the backfill? What do we do in terms of supporting those skills opportunities for those companies, those small companies across North Wales who will be inevitably losing staff to go and work on some of these projects? So in terms of if we look at obviously Anglesey with Wilver Nelwith, in terms of currently, we have 2,687 people who are construction workers in the last census who registered for working in that industry. But is that going to be enough? My challenge now to you this morning is to come to a bit of an interactive element of the presentation. So you see the figure there for Anglesey, 2,687 of people who are employed in construction in North Wales. If we're to move across the region and go next door, for Gwynedd, and ask over this side of the room, would you think it's higher or lower? Higher. higher? It is indeed. 5,185 people. Now this is where it gets a bit play your cards right. Um, <laughs> higher or lower for Conwy and Gwynedd? Lower. 4,105. You're getting good at this. Um, for Denbyshire, do we think it's higher or lower than Conwy? No. Are you sure? Okay. 3,482. Now this is where it gets interesting. We move across to Flintshire. Do we think it's higher or lower than Denbyshire? Higher. Okay, you're correct. 5,675 of the current labour market in Flintshire is registered as construction workers. And your final test Wrexham, which has the large, one of the largest populations in North Wales and is a very condensed uh, kind of county borough. Do we think it's higher or lower than Flintshire? Lower. You've read the notes in advance. Congratulations. <laughs> but that just shows in terms of the breadth of the construction sector, which will have an impact in terms of the energy sector. And Miller Research, many of you will be aware, um, undertook a very detailed study for Welsh Government um, last year which looked at um, an analysis of the types of skills for the energy sector. I know it's very small on screen now, but we will share these slides with you post the event today. But again, it breaks down what Miller did in terms of the research, is break down the skill and learning need. They looked at the sectors within the energy broader sector, and they broke down the type of job role and level, and identified the risk in terms of the skills gaps. Now the challenge for us in North Wales is to take this analysis on and actually apply it to ourselves here within the region as best we can. Because there are a number of jobs within the energy sector ranging from administration to engineers to welders to bricklayers, drivers and so on and so forth. Wolverine with alone is estimated to have at peak potentially 8,500 people working on site during the construction phase which will encompass up to potentially again 25,000 different roles during that construction phase. So again, we need to be prepared. Because for us in North Wales, we're looking at this figure, we're looking at a figure of 40,000 new jobs collectively across all sectors, across all of North Wales, estimated in the next 10 to 15 years. We need to be prepared. We need to be supporting the demands of employers and supporting the supplies in terms of our providers because it is very much opportunity for us in North Wales. We as the Ambition Board are working very closely with our partners, both in the public and private sector, to support their needs in delivering these skills. And we have numerous outlets um, to support that, from infographics to our Twitter feed, which are very much just tip of the iceberg. This is the kind of the shop window, as it were. The detail is very much about us working collectively together to deliver on the various projects that we have to support females going into STEM subjects, to support our providers, to support the supply chains, all of which will need additional skills and the right support to make sure that we prosper as a region and we support ambition as we move forward. Thank you very much. I was also thinking very huge competition 
shortage of welders. We saw welders coming up in that wordle as you know what people are talking about. That's a that's a nationwide problem, probably a European problem. Uh, and in terms of competition, for we, we, you know, we've got these opportunities. We're going to compete to get people to be involved in our projects. I think I'm right in saying that the biggest consumer of engineering graduates, which is you and were saying we're going to really need, the biggest consumer of those at the moment is the financial services sector in the city of London and their many hundred thousand pound salaries. And why? Because our engineers, our engineering graduates understand all that technical algorithm stuff, which is certainly beyond the BBC correspondent. Um, so a lot of information there, but really useful, and I think it just highlights to us the opportunities, but also the challenges that are ahead of us. And I wonder really how much what you and was saying was chiming with your experience in the room. I'm sure quite a bit in various ways, our minds are probably linking things together. And I think it will certainly help us, that context will help us uh, talk about what is needed on the demand side this morning in our first session and the view from the employers. So after we hear from each of our speakers representing the employers' views this morning, there's going to be an opportunity to ask each other questions and to discuss some of these issues and points that you've heard. So I'd like you to reflect really on what you've heard as we go along on the data, on the background. If you've forgotten the numbers, don't worry. It's the sort of emphasis of it. I'm sure you can help us with the numbers. Um, and when you've heard from our employers, consider what opportunities, possibly threats, challenges, uh, specifically the detail on the broader energy sector, what you see those as. So my task then will be uh, to bring together the discussion. My task now is to introduce the first of our employers to outline what demands uh, there could be on the skills base and labour market in the region. So I'm very glad to say that we have Mark Tippett from Horizon Nuclear Power here. Uh, Mark's their learning and development manager and is becoming an increasingly familiar face alongside other colleagues from Horizon who are already here in North Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mark Tippett.
So this is our site. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining the details of the site because I, I suspect a lot of you in the room have actually already heard the presentation, or probably several from the horizon. <coughs> but essentially, um, existing power station, which has been there since the 1970s, is up at the top left-hand corner of the picture there. And the new development is the big footprint space. You can see two distinct units there. Um, lower down. So it's a big area that we're developing um, and a lot of work involved in doing that, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Just to bring up the timeline, um, the time, it's, it's a very long-term project. I mean, this is one of, the, one of the key things about the project. It's, um, you know, we, we, we think in terms of 10-year blocks almost. So, you know, it's going to be 10 years before we get the first operation. And that's a very long operational life after that. So we've got a few, a few key dates I think, coming up at the end of the yes. um, So some key dates. I mean, this is, this is what's happening behind the scenes. And I think some people observe the project and say, well, what are you actually doing at the moment? You know, what's going on? There is a great deal going on. Um, one of the biggest things that is happening at the moment is what we call generic design assessment, which is a technical assessment of technology has to be done in the UK using the regulator and working with the regulator. And that's going quite well. We're expecting that approval to be given by the end of 2017. And then main planning approval by 2018. Um, nuclear site license, we need to be a, a site license uh, operator. Also 2018, so the application for that goes in quite soon. Um, main construction for 2019 and then first operation in the middle of the next decade. So all of these things, when you, when you look at the dates, it sounds quite a long way away, but actually it's not really. Um, and, and applying to be a site license company is in itself quite a big operation. And it's been concentrating a lot of minds in, in headquarters on the horizon for a long time. Um, behind this, we are um, consulting with stakeholders. So we run our, our phase one consultation, free application consultation uh, last year. Got a lot of useful feedback from that. And we have the second phase of that um, pre application consultation round two coming up at the end of this year. And so we're doing a lot of work to prepare for that. And I spent a lot of my time writing the jobs and skills sessions of that at the moment. Um, so there is a great deal happening, even though it may not be obvious that it's happening to everyone. So just to say a little bit about, about the construction and um, we're looking, when we start main construction in 2019, we're, we're looking at a 60-month program. Um, our Japanese colleagues, Hitachi GE is the technology provider. Um, our Japanese colleagues tell us that in Japan they can build one of these things in four years. Um, allowing for the fact that this is not being built in Japan, we're allowing a little bit of extra time. But even so, uh, a five-year construction program of this size is quite a challenge. So, my colleagues are, are thinking about how we are going to do this. Um, we've started pre-construction works already. There's, there's been work done on the site. One of the biggest ground investigation surveys has, has been completed already, and another phase of that is starting quite soon. Um, and as, as I've said already, the main construction then from 2019, but there's a lot of work to be done to prepare the site before we get into the main construction. Um, aggregate workforce, this, uh, I'm just going to explain a little bit about this, this number because it, it's, it can get misunderstood. The aggregate workforce is 4,000, that's the average workforce. If you, if you drew a, it is actually a, a bell-shaped diagram of the workforce over that 60-month period, um, and then drew a, a horizontal line through it, you can see that roughly that's roughly 4,000 workers, and it does get to a peak of about 8,500. Um, those are not all new jobs. Some of those jobs, by the nature of the work, are quite specialist in the workforce is transitory, so it moves around the world. Um, so that, that is not literally an initial workforce of 8,500. But there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of extra jobs to be created, and I particularly like you and this ripple diagram, which I can't match. Um, but actually, that, that does indicate that there are a lot of uh, jobs behind, service jobs, etc., that support a workforce of that size. And we do fully expect that there will be thousands of new jobs created. Um, 
we are, just to explain the project lead, so Horizon is the project lead, and Hitachi G is the technology provider. Um, and Hitachi G is 90% is, uh, Hitachi and about 10% of G in America. Um, and then we are waiting with bated breath, and have been all this year so far, the appointment of a tier one contractor, who is going to probably be a company to be recognised. You have seen their name on construction sites around the UK, but there will be a big company with a lot of experience of construction. And that tier one contractor will then be responsible for appointing the supply chain construction. I'm sure they'll be engaging with uh, you and his colleagues. Um, and with many of the companies up here in North Wales, because the construction is not just about building a power station, it's about building lots of the ancillary bits that are off-site, such as work accommodation, etc. Um, so, I think that's probably all I'll say for this point about construction. I'll say a little bit about operation. Operation is, is more the sort of area that I'm familiar with, but ironically it's, it's quite a long way in the future, so I'm, I'm better able to talk about this, but, but um, it, it is uh, probably 2020s before we get to, to first operation. Having said that, there are lots of things that we can start doing now to prepare for the future operation of the power station. And the, the biggest things that we can do already is to start thinking and training some of the key workers who work at the power station. Um, so, headline figures, um, you know, it's, it's a big station, it's going to produce a lot of power, um, you know, enough power for Wales effectively, although it's feeding into the national grid, so, you know, the power is for the UK. Um, station staff up to about 1,000. A lot of those are technical workers, so two thirds of those are technical workers, at least, probably more like 70% actually. So, the sort of the sort of background those people are going to have will be engineering degrees, apprenticeships, STEM subjects, will be STEM qualified. <coughs> Hence, we are very interested in promoting STEM. I've got a couple of slides just at the end about the education engagement we're involved in. Um, the, we are working uh, on the basis of best practice, and so we're working with international institutes, nuclear institutes, such as INPO and WANO, to derive best practice for this. The, the nuclear industry is a very international industry, both in terms of the construction and the operation of stations. And the pictures there are actually ABWR stations in Japan. Um, so we are very keen to, to approach this uh, in an unblinkered way and to think about you know, where in the world is best practice. So we are talking about um, focusing some best practice here in North Wales, which in itself is Challenges for the next two years. Um, I've already mentioned the tier one contractor. That appointment will be very important in terms of answering some of the questions that have been put to me and my colleagues for quite a long time now in terms of the definition and detail of the construction project. Um, we are awaiting that appointment uh, eagerly and we're hoping it's going to be made quite soon. And obviously, all, everyone will hear about that in North Wales once the appointment is made. Um, we are working uh, on, on some key programs, training programs. We have a very close relationship already with the college group here, with the college Menai, um, and we are launching a, an engineering apprenticeship in 2016. Bear in mind that it takes about three to four years to train an engineering apprenticeship, apprentice at level three. So once those apprentices are trained, they have more development, if you like, and more, more experience to gain. Before they, they get to even set foot on the power station, help be started at the start of a program that will happen year in, year out for quite a long time. I mentioned the, the pre application to consultation, jobs and skills strategy. I know the Isle of Anglican Council are very keen to consult with us on that. So we're beavering away right on the jobs and skills strategies. We, uh, and, and hopefully the tier one contract for the input to that. And, and something once again, borrowing good practice from um, other UK projects, etc., an employment brokerage is, is uh, something which is worked very effectively in the index before, and also at uh, the point that we're looking to set up an employment brokerage, uh, and we'll be consulting with uh, stakeholders here quite soon about 
that. Um, we need to continue, continue to talk to you about, about skills, and I know you're very keen to talk to us about that. Um, and wherever possible, we, we are trying to provide employment, training, and other opportunities here in North Wales. And the one appointment that's close to my heart at the moment, uh, which I'm actually involved in interviewing for this week, is the apprentice scheme manager, which is a key, key post, a very important post. They will be based here in North Wales. Well, they would be a Welsh speaker, which I am not unfortunately. Uh, we'll be able to um, and very briefly, because I'm aware of time, but this is this is just an indication of where we've got to in the last 12 months, and things are picking up, uh, um, picking up pace. Education engagement 12 months ago was something that was a little bit ad hoc, and I think there was a lot of expectation for the horizon to come along and just fill the boots of magnets and magnets have done a lot of really good stuff. Past engaging with schools and colleges. Um, it's a very difficult act to follow uh, immediately, so, so we're having to sort of pick up speed and borrow things from as we go along. But in terms of education engagement, um, some of you know my colleague Claire Burgess, who is full time on that, um, and we, we have a strategy which is emerging, and the strategy really involves <laughs> spending a lot of time engaging with as many of the schools as possible. So the engagement with schools and agencies is really the cornerstone of the strategy. As far as resource allows in the rest of North Wales, but obviously in neighbouring counties on the mainland, and then to a smaller extent in England, our headquarters in Gloucester. So you do come under a little bit of gentle pressure from the, the MP down there to get involved in education engagement in the Gloucester area. But it is very much focused on schools and agency as the main point of focus. A number of different things we're in, engaged in, you can read the slides there, but we, we're trying to do this in a holistic way, so we're, we're trying to inspire younger children, probably primary school age children, to uh, take an interest in STEM subjects, um, really taking the view that from the age of seven upwards, you know, this is the time to try to inspire um, children to, to look at science and maths, etc. Informing uh, and engaging and informing children, probably of a slightly older age, about future jobs and recruitment opportunities and the recruitment process and providing some of those skills. Um, and then uh, spending some time equipping slightly older children again with, with skills and providing, for instance, work experience, etc. So, so that is uh, the sort of thing that we're involved in. It takes quite a lot of resource and effort, very rewarding, uh, and there's more of, more of our staff to get based up here in North Wales, I'm sure a lot of them would be persuaded to get involved in education engagement. Um, and this is just a, a roundup slide to sort of uh, <coughs> fill in some of the other gaps, some of the things we're doing. Um, I think there are some education resources here somewhere, actually, I haven't spotted them yet. But um, STEM engagement very important, but we have to focus that because we can spend a lot of time doing it in a general way. We can try to focus it on the opportunities that are coming up in our project. Um, we've been involved in mock interviews, careers, events. Expect to be involved in more of those as we go forward. Uh, rent a farm, protein program, etc. Um, so I've nearly finished. This is just a few of our stakeholders. Working in partnership is very important, so it's significant that I'm standing here today. Uh, in, in one of the colleges and one of our key partners working with the college group is going to be very important. Um, there's at least one person from Bangor University here today and Bangor University is a very important stakeholder as well. But by, by the nature of this project, um, the whole of the North Wales uh, region will be involved in some shape or form, so probably Cambria, New University um, and others as well as we take it forward. So building the partnership partnership model um, is, is going to be a significant thing over the next few years. And finally, that is our mission, which I think I've probably explained already. So, thank you for your attention. Of quite a lot of the details, but I think it's always useful to be reminded of quite 
the impact that this investment will have, even down to, of course, food and drink and all sorts of other allied industries. Uh, it's really nice to be reminded of that. I think we'll probably need to keep reminding ourselves over the years. And also to give you the time scale, because perhaps that's to remind us that the time scale gives us a sense of uh, the, that there are opportunities and challenges, but opportunities that we might have the time to actually find solutions to, which is uh, nicely optimistic. So thank you very much. And if you've got questions uh, for Mark, please kind of keep them on your brain or screw them down on a piece of paper, because they'll be really useful for the discussion that we will have uh, very soon, uh, looking very much at um, employers' views and perspectives and the demand side. Now, our next speaker has come from Swansea, where many of you uh, will have been noticing the developing of the first tidal lagoon in Swansea Bay. That's gathering momentum. We're meant to get an announcement this week. Um, some people's pulses in this room are probably slightly higher than others, let's say. Um, it's particularly interesting for us as well here in North Wales, because this technology and innovation could possibly uh, come to this, one, this region too, should a similar, and I think it would be larger, development than Swansea come here around Colwyn Bay. Therefore, very, we're very lucky um, to drag him away from his office at this time um, to be joined by Johan Jenkins, who's Development Director for Wales on behalf of Tidal Lagoon Power. Johan, you're the man with the pulse beating to reckon this week. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak to you. My first challenge is to do a half hour presentation in 15 minutes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess the presentation on, on the journey of Swansea, I'm just picking up some of the key construction methods that we'll be using. Just for you to get an appreciation of, of what we'll be looking to do over the, over the coming years. So let's get straight into it. So um, as, as Sarah mentioned earlier, Swansea Bay will be the first risk guide in the world. Um, we've identified about 15 locations throughout the UK where we believe we can build something can build tidal tidal, based on a high tidal range and relatively shallow water. Um, shallow water for ease of construction, and therefore cost. Our focus is on six lagoons. Six lagoons to be built for us in the next 12 years. Uh, hugely exciting that four of those that we are developing are within Wales. So it gives us in Wales a great opportunity that we have global leaders in lagoon technology, development, construction, design and operation. Swansea Bay being the first, uh, it's by no coincidence that we've got a couple of red dots in the same estuary, and those relating to Newport, Cardiff uh, and Bridgewater. That's the second highest tidal range in the world. Uh, North Wales, then Colwyn Bay, is still very much one that we're looking to develop and we are now developing probably for the best part of 14 to 18 months. Um, and at the northern point, then we're looking at, at West Cumbria. So those six lagoons delivering about 8% of, of the UK's energy, each lagoon operational for a minimum of 120 years. And that bit on the end, the affordable energy bit, yes, we will need a contract for difference from what we're looking at 35 years, so that's the subsidy. But for us, no subsidy required then after for that 185 years and more. To enable us to meet one of our ambitions, I'm told by our PR people that we can't use the word target, but it's certainly a target of mine, is that we spend 50% of Swansea Bay in Wales. So if it's a billion pounds, then we need to make sure we spend half a billion pounds in Wales over the next four years or so, four years being the construction time. And 65% within the UK. So 650 million in the UK, 500 million within Wales, and that's just on Swansea. If you look at that, at the budget, roughly for six lagoons, it's about 30 billion pounds. So at West Swansea, uh, for West Swansea 1565, there has to be a determination that we deliver more within Wales and the UK as we progress. In terms of jobs, then two studies we 
English at one by Cardiff Business School looking at Swansea. And they say during construction about 1,850 jobs, about 60 to operate and maintain that after permanent jobs, and then about 90 jobs supported recreation and tourism. And I suppose it's at this point you think what to talk about tourism and recreation for, because this is a publication. But I'll show you that in the okay. um, So to achieve our ambition, or my target, is that we need to deliver a new industry within the UK based in Wales. And because Swansea is the first, then the first of our assembly facilities will be within the Swansea Bay City region. That said, further down the line, there is no reason that we couldn't have one in North Wales. If we have 16 turbines, as an example for Swansea, then those five, those five other lagoons require about 600 turbines. A turbine for us is 600 tons, it's about 8 metres tall and about 18 metres long. But that's only one of that. So let's see what I was talking about. This is a journey about three years ago, three and a half, about four years ago. This is what's in. Somebody's hopefully going to turn that up. wall is accessible um, as long as it's safe to do so. We have a wall building, cycle on it, run along it, there will be a little bus running back and forth also. But this is how the power is generated. The bi directional turbine so this is operating four times a day. This year the first year to our 26 turbines I think. But we've actually got 16 turbines for small seats. A little bit bigger than what you can see on the screen. And they're sitting on the seabed. You can see within that here, yeah, we get gates, it's effectively doors to enable us to build up the head of water, driving the turbines, which effectively drives the turbines. As the tide falls, the process is reversed. Let me do the same thing the other way, just close the doors, wait for the, the head on the outside to raise. So that's about, the top of this one, about 40 hours, more than 40 hours a day. 
just you mumble his head on the right hand side. I'm just referring to a competition that we had still running to identify three pieces of uh, culture that support us in the world. This is referring to the, the Oyster, the offshore visitor center. Pick up a bit about the presentation, but uh, this will be two and a half kilometers out at sea, coming up from the three floors. You just have access to the seabed to see the turbines turning, and then access to the control room. And within that offshore facility, there will be a dedicated education facility. This bit here referring to um, how we look to introduce marine life to that 9.4 km wall, effectively taking it there. A sea reef. And this highlighting some of the the sporting events that we want to attract to the pool, whether it's sailing, whether it's rowing, whether it's triathlon, whether it's open water swimming. But that's the footprint, that's the final footprint. With the docks just to the north. Very much a quiet version of <laughs> But about the, uh, about the, um, uh, the recreation bit, uh, uh, with, with that report done by Swatham and Cantu University, they said we expect between 100, between 70 and 100,000 visitors spending between uh, 1.7 and 2.1 billion pounds a year. Also saying that that's quite conservative. Um, Quoting that we're in key in Cardiff now gets on the million visitors. But that's the, that's the footprint. Um, the, the docks just to the north, 9.5 kilometer wall turbine sitting on the seabed, about two and a half kilometers out at sea, adjacent to the turbine housing that we have for a visitor center, offshore visitor center. Um, just on the western side, on the western wall, that's where we'll have our main visitor orientation center. And very much the important idea, I think. Where we'll have uh, changing rooms, we'll have probably a cafe, we'll have shower facilities, we'll have workshops to support that, that sailing and, and canoeing or kayaking activity on, on, within the lagoon. Um, and I'll probably pick up points here that, that Sarah brought up. That, that lagoon is, surface area is 11.5 kilometers. Uh, I'll just leave that um, that for the moment. And I don't know. Lynn and, and Roy remember, but last time I, I sh we showed that film in there was the 13th of, or it was the 7th of February 2013, where we, after consulting about 50, I suppose, different organizations across North Wales, this side of North Wales, we, um, Lynn and Mark, our chief exec, hosted a, a dinner here in that room, and, and we presented the lagoon that we were looking to develop in North Wales for Colway Bay. Remember, this is 9.5. Our ambition for North Wales was a little 87 kilometres, um, 40 turbines, the wall length, I think, about 22 kilometres, which was 9.5. Um, but there was a strong ask that evening um, <coughs> whether we could make it bigger. I don't want to take the back with that. Um, but when you, when you live in North Wales, you understand the challenges. What the challenges North Wales face, you can understand why people would want to make it bigger. And that's, and that's in terms of flood defense. So, our engineers looked at the floodplain of North Wales, um, and now we're looking at a lagoon which is 124 kilometers surface area, about 75 lagoons, uh, 75 turbines, that generating enough, about 20% of, of Wales's electricity requirement. Um, and we're just starting to model to see if that will actually um, work as a flood defense. What's the social economic benefits of being in the lagoon to North Wales? But where are we? Um, we mentioned earlier that the is looking soon to 
nominate and look at the KTO and the contractors, then, then we're just coming out of that process. So if we were to look at, at six packages, um, then for the power generation and operating, then that's been won by a joint venture between G and Andrew Hydro. Andrew Hydro is certainly one of the top three hydro deliverers in, in the world. So we're delighted to have those on board. And GE, I think, speaks for themselves in terms of <coughs> on the sluice skates and on turbine structure, which is sitting on the seabed. Then Lano Rock have just been appointed as, as uh, preferred bidders. Um, the Marine Works, then that's from last week. The Czech China Harbour Engineering Company. And still in the Wales, Alec Griffiths in South Wales, that's a 25 million pound contract. Buildings will be going on sale to Wales at the end of the month. Um, so effectively, we have now got our tier one contractors, and we will be working closely with them over the next couple of months to enable us to get on site for us in our timeline by September of this year. But as I said earlier, um, we need to get over two hurdles: one being planning consent, and by 12 o'clock Wednesday night, we will get an answer. Um, no later, because that's a, a formal legal timetable. If I said, if I said I might have it again. <laughs> we will also need a marine license from, from Welsh Government to work in Welsh waters. We will also need to agree that CFD with deck, And we will need to raise that billion pounds to build the Swansea Bay title pool, which we're very confident in doing. Um, so in terms of, of CFD and in terms of marine license, there, there is no legal timetable, but being in control of our own destiny, we want that done and dusted by the end of August, enabling us to get on site by about September, October of this year. And there we are. Um, so if we are on site September, October of this year, then we will, will be powering to the grid by Feb February, March of 2019. During that time, we will be building at least Another two lagoons. So six lagoons for us, remember, is 12 years. Construction program, very quickly. Um, year one, so this is about February, March of next year, coming off that Western Fund and Eastern Fund. Uh, that work done by, by Czech. Already at this point, Alan Griffiths would have been on site doing the ancillary civils, building the site offices, building the, the road infrastructure. Um, so you can see as well as coming off eastern and western walls to those points, we'll be building a tem tem temporary coffer dam. Over the winter period, we'll be pumping that coffer dam dry and enabling civil activities to get under the seabed, so that's Langer Rock. Marine Works, year one, a year two, and extending those, those walls, both east and west. Importantly, Extending that pool uh, come the outlet, which currently pumps raw sewage during soft conditions, we're extending that 1.5 kilometers. <coughs> An enormous amount of work taking place within that within that coffer dam at this point, building those turbine structures. And then year three, taking away that that coffer dam after doing drying and commissioning of those tur turbines and slip skirts and then closing the roof of the wall. We've moved away from the geotubes, so this is another option we've probably been discussing for about 18 months. This is what we've decided to go with with the tier one contractors. Similar, but instead of having the geotubes, we'd have to get on the outside, we can save sand and silk core with our lock on the outsides. So how do we do that? First thing we have to do is is to construct both birds on, 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 the, on the seabed. And using a, probably a splitter barge, then we'll be forming both birds. If using that pipe type of mechanism, placing both birds in place as aggregate, then the splitter barge comes along after being filled by that dredge material from within the, the boom wall, and then just gently placing that, that sand and silt between those birds. And then just building up the, the layer of cake, as you can see there. So all of this is standard um, technology, standard construction methodology, 
and mm -hmm. you break the water then using using standard civil engineering capture. Facing the armor rock, I see an off the balloon wall until we achieve that design. Oh, that's a typical cut of pressure. And this is what people will see out on the bay. So that, that front cut of pressure pumped onto that pontoon and then into the split of arch. That's a different type of dredging. This for us is the armor rock being delivered by sea. So we're looking at 375,000 ton barges arriving every week, um, taking the traffic off the road effectively. And placing the armor rock, as you can see in these slides. And this again, standard marine technology, nothing new in what we're looking to do. It gives you an appreciation, I think, of what those skill sets will require. So this is fascinating. So that, that's, that's what we will see at the, the seabed in Swansea. There's the temp temporary coffer dam, slightly different design of what we're looking at. But you can see that the still skates on the left and then the turbine housing on the right hand side. And that's the temporary structure. To give you a scale of that. Um, <coughs> that's that's the cross section of, of the structure on the seabed. And that's a turbine. That's a 7.5 meter turbine we can use a 7.35. So that gives you an appreciation of big these turbines are. These are the draft tubes sticking out to the back of that turbine structure. Um, 16 for us, and then sitting just to the left on our design, we have the turbine housing, which is there. Again, it gives you an idea of scale of what we're looking to deliver. Remember, if this is 16, then every lagoon thereafter is, is an awful lot bigger. Currently, Swansea is coming in at 90 turbines, 75 turbines at, at um, Corwin Bay, West County, 100. I think 16. Uh, but these, these, these numbers will change as the engineers optimize the design. But significantly move bigger moving forward. So in terms of, let's go back to the turbines. So in terms of the turbines, about two years ago, we started to understand what whales could do and what could whales, whales couldn't do. And if whales can't do it, then where can we find it in terms of casting, forging, fabricating, welding, painting? Um, and that's the mechanical element. Sadly, in rails, we've lost just about all the, the electrical elements. Um, but we still got some, some clusters of activity in Pembroke and Swansea, Cardiff, Chepstow, <coughs> a little bit of North Wales, but where we didn't have that capability to do the casting, the forging, the big machining, then we still just about got that in, in, in the Midlands, South Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, <coughs> Tyneside, and in the North East. So remember the challenge that we've given ourselves is minimum 50% spent in well, 65% in the UK. So we had to find companies that would be excited enough to be a part of this, this journey. And importantly, that was a key consideration when nominated tier one contractors. If you don't deliver the 50 and 65%, then you don't get considered. So in terms of the turbines, this is where it got us to. Um, another historic meeting, I guess, this time in, in Gloucester, myself, Mark, our chief exec, Roger, the head of the title of one industry group, four chief executives, um, three from GE, one from Congress, <coughs> and they committed to do this. So all the power generation kit will be done in the UK, which is which is okay, it's good. If GE already has, has a footprint, but still, uh, <coughs> still a big achievement. But the real achievement is where Andritz doesn't have a footprint in the UK, or Wales. So Andritz committed to delivering, I think there's about 12 component parts there. Nine of those component parts within the UK, at least just the main component parts. There are hundreds and thousands of other component parts. But to get Andritz to a point where they are guaranteeing us that they will deliver 53% within the UK, I think is fantastic. The challenge for us, or well, the challenge for Welsh business and skills, to ensure that we can deliver that. And really that's that's negligible in terms of what we're looking to deliver within the next 12 years. 
Remember that 16, we need 600. And that's just one component part. Going back to the point of building earlier on the slip skates for this, there are, we will need just the slip skates, 120 welders, welding non stop. Well, I suggest we do that right? But welding non stop for 18 months. And that's just on the slip skates without anything else. So in terms of, of, of the, what we do in terms of education, so in Swansea and in Portalba, we've been running education programs for probably the last year, primary, secondary, FE, that's just education, to <coughs> inspire young people, and I suppose to exchange some of, of our thinking in terms of what we're looking <coughs> for Swansea and on there after throughout the UK. But to enable us to deliver that industry, then it's critical that we move some of those young people into the skills and training. So what we're doing there, when we're working with that were all of our tier one contractors, they're, they're using the CITB then forecasting tool, which is being tweaked to enable it to be bespoke to, to the rooms, to the swatch of the room. We take that all that information from the one contractors, feed it into the, that, that bespoke model that we're developing, scaling that up for those other five lagoons that will tell us how many people we need with what skill sets, run a baseline, and then we've got a huge gap, I think. I'm very confident with that, actually. Um, and then the challenge is, what do we do? How do we fill that gap? Um, and that gap is across all disciplines, whether it's also who will be involved in the food industry or the tourism industry, it will be engineers, it will be welders. Uh, it will be supporting those hundreds of thousands of visitors coming to Swansea Bay, so lots of hospitality. So that's, that's, that's the journey we're on. And hopefully, on Thursday, we're still on that same journey. <laughs> <laughs> Mae'n 
Cantanin son am suivi yn y diwydiannau cynhyrchu ynni, cael dyn ni hefyd gofio am yr holl suivi dan o wyner sydd yn mynd i fod yn aniniodurchol yn dilyn o'r suivi yna. Mae'n bwysig bod ni ddim yn anghofio am y suivi yn y sectora gwasanaeth er ein laeth, yn ei son am nhw'n benewydd, fe 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 sonio diwan yn gynharach am y rhoffor fwyd ag ati, Mae'n bwysig yn bod ni'n anodd yn cwmnia bychu i ddod at ei gilydd i weithio yn gydweithredol, ond non trydrynyddol i weld sydd mae'n nhw yn mynd i fanteisio ar y cyfliodd unfawr o fwydo 8,000 o bobl yn y wylfa newydd. Mae'r gwaith yna yn gwaith pwysig a rhaid yn ei ffeindio anghofion dan ofo, lle da ni fel partneriaid yn y sector addysg, yn y sector byd busnas, yn gallu anodd y cwmnia bychau Roedd Iwan yn son amdano fo sydd yn bodoli yn y gogledd o'r llewyn a'r draws gogledd Cymru i weithio efo'i gilydd i gael y Swydi. Mae eisiau symud pobl i'r wylfa newydd. Symud 4,000 o bobl ar gyfer taled am bum lynedd. O dyna chi job i gwrni â bysys yn ta. Mae eisiau ni ddenw am y cymleoedd yma drwy ddi draw, ni just y cymleoedd technegol yn yr ochr stem. Yn sydyn wrth edrych ar y map o ynys môn, Dwi'n cyfeirio chi, top gogledd uh, rochor chwyd, Winesto, da chi'n gwybod ychydig bod sôn am Winesto yn diweddar. Yn gysylltiedig am Winesto hefyd, mae'r parth menter morlais, mae menter môn wedi sefyd dwi'n ma na. Just yw'r gipsiwr i chi, mewn cymlaf o dde yng Nglynnar, yn yr Orcni, mae'n wedi datblygu uh, sector ynni o'r môr, sydd yn cofnod i dros 300 o bobl. Mae hynny yn y sector cynhyrchu, yn y gystal a'r sector gwasanaethu. Stena, porthladd cael gyfi, mae yna gyfleoedd sydd yn deillio yn hermasgilia sydd i angen ar gyfer symud peiriannau allan i'r môr. Os da ni'n edrych â projectau datblygu fel Project Minesto a Project Aerill yn ynys môr, da ni'n sôn am Project Amwaith, Project da ni'n sôn am bobl sydd o'r osgilia, ystod eang o osgilia ar ochr dechnegol y cath i'r ochr lle mae yna wasanaethu yn dod i mewn i dy fod. London Lakes, da chi'n gwybod ag gyd am hynna, os ydy Wilfa Newydd, pan mae'r Wilfa Newydd yn gyrru lai, pedair ni fod swyddi, i ni o'n gyrchol, wyth ni o'r eicha, lle mae'r bobl yna yn mynd i'r ffeindio lle i ddiw. Y brwydwyd efo y London Lakes ydy bod ni'n dechra gyda'r terfyn mewn golw, a mae yna wedi dros dro'n digwydd bod yna waddol yn dod allan ohono fo, a mae'n wladol yr eich sy'n eich siampl o'r waddol yna yn hermaf mi fydd yna ar ddiwad yr cyfnod adeiladu fylfa newydd, mi fydd yna adeiladu ag ati yna ar gyfer yr ochr tywistiaeth. Wrth dios, yr enw newydd ar ddarblygiad lateral power, cwmni biomas, mae nhw'n edrych dyddiad i gyflogi 500 o bobl ar y safle yna. Sgilia o'r ochr dechnegol, cynhyrchu trydan, i'r ochr amgylcheddol, yn ymwneud â cynhyrchu bwyd. Mae cwmni Magnox yn gweithio yn traws fynydd ar lwyfa, gwaith yn ei fod yn dod i ben yn fan yna. Y sialens, fel yna fi'n wan gyfeirio at y bod yn cael ac sydd ydyn ni'n cadw'r talent ta yna yng Ngogledd Cymru, a sydd ydyn ni'n gallu sicrhau bod y swyddi ar gyfer y dyfodol bod hi'n ei ar gael i bobl o fan yna. SP Energy Networks, yn ei SP Manweb, o'n maen nhw'n cael ei galw'r gwan Back to the Future ia, o Manweb. Maen nhw yn edrych am dros bymthag o brentisiad o blwyddyn a draws gogled Cymru. Da chi'n ymwneud bod o'r hynny? Mae cwmnia fel National Grid hefyd yn edrych am brentisiad a graddedigion ar draws gogled Cymru. Swyddi fel yna, mae nhw wedi pin bach o'r golw, ond mae nhw yna. Yn dyna ni'n gwneud i gonni sbysebu yn pobl i fancni yn ysgorion a'n colegau ni o'r cyfleoedd yna. Yn ar parc, gwyddoniaeth, Ems Park, datblygiad yn môn, mi fydd yr adeilad cyntaf i fyny fan â 2007, 2008, a'r bwriad yn fan â cwmnia mawr yn dod i fewn fel partneriaid angor ac yn datblygu canolfan ymchwil a datblygu yna. Eto cyfleoedd, sy'n 200, 300, 400 o gyfleoedd i bobl i fan i datblygu fel technegwyr yn dod i fewn ei hynna. O fewn hyn i gyd, da ni'n sôn yn tyda ni fel partneriaid am greu pibell sgliliau tros gwyddadwy. 
Ac yn gyflam fan yma, ystalwm, mae'n ei gweithio'n bilfa. A broblem o gweithio'n bilfa oedd tyddo gilch i ddim yn drosglwyd adwyn un llarall ar ôl i'r sut i gyd i flannu. Rwan, mae'n gyflam i'n gyflam fan yma, i allu o gyd i fynd yn gweithio'n bilfa, hefyd yn mynd i weithio yn y gogledwyran, yn ynglanad y ffwyd. Mae gyflam i'n gyflam o bobl ymeirionydd yn gallu gweithio a symud i sgiliau mewn llenydd eraill. Felly mae'n gyflaen fawr yma yma gyfeillion o gwmpas o'r hyn sydd yn digwydd yn môn, o gwmpas o'r hyn sydd yn digwydd yn y partha mynter ar draws y gogledd i wefnewid yr economi, ond mae'n rhaid i ni gyd gweithio i sicrhau bod ni'n mwyhau y byd i'n ardaloedd. Mae sgiliau ydy yr ys peth sydd rhaid gweithio arno o'r rwan cyn i'r cwmni yma neu i penderfyniad gysoddiad terfynol. Diolch o rhywun chi. The nuclear industry is, is sometimes accused, sometimes fairly, of being a little bit elitist. It was interesting what, what John Idris Jones just said about uh, when he works at Wilbur and transferability, transferability of skills. Um, there's a misconception, I think, that everyone who works in the nuclear industry is, is a boffin and wears a white coat and, and you know, is interested to the point of, of being interested outside of work as well in nuclear physics. Yes, we do need people with nuclear physics qualifications, but we need lots of other people as well. And the transferability of skills is a very important point. So I think the almost the first challenge is to get that message across to, to everyone, including people at school and their parents and teachers, that actually there are lots of opportunities here. Many of them are technical, so it is important to uh, promote STEM skills, science and, and maths, etc. in schools and to get people interested, but that is not the be all and end all of this. There, there is a very wide range of opportunity out there, and I think that's an important message. And sometimes in the nuclear industry, that, that message is um, is misconceived, I think, because there is well, that... because we think of it as too narrow. Yeah, we tend to think of the nuclear industry perhaps as, as being, you know, very science-based, very specialist. Um, it is effectively a power station in the same way as any other power station. It just so happens that the heat source is different, mm -hmm. but everything else about it is pretty much the same as any other power station. Now we heard from you and some of the gaps that we've already got. Any employers here in the room, uh, any of you already aware of where it really is hard to find the right people? Anyone, I, I won't make you talk, I'm just interested. Anyone aware of any skills gaps at the moment, any employers? Because, John, on the ground, that's the big, biggest challenge for us as a nation, really, isn't it? How we can fulfil as many of these jobs ourselves. It, it is, um, and it's almost too late. If we're talking about a project that's going to be starting in two years' time, we need to be thinking now of, if we're talking of youngsters that are in schools, and we need to be thinking in terms of a skills pipeline, all the way from primary school to secondary school, all the way through, 
And we're talking now, we're talking about a 10, 15 year project when we start to, to think like that. We also need to be thinking about how we actually attract people back to North Wales. People from North Wales that we in this room, I'm sure, will know that are working out maybe in the Middle East on some projects out in the Middle East. How can we get them back into the locality, bring their families back into the locality to, to, to grow up in the area? Um, in terms of um, skills development, we need to be doing more to actually convincing parents of the opportunities. We seem to be missing out there big time. And, and why do you think we are? Because I, I don't, not, don't mean that in any kind of blame way, but we almost need to know why we're missing out to then know where we need to focus our energies and change that. And is it because we've looked at it as too much as a nuclear industry rather than you know, the food, the drink, the roads, the everything else, the housing? The... I don't think we're selling the totality of what's there. And it's this transferability. I used to work for a guy called Greg Edmonds at Wilbur. And Greg used to go around schools. He was an inspirational speaker. Still is, actually. Don't tell him he was. Um, but one of the things that Greg used to say, he used to stand up, I remember going to me and I heard Stone Greg saying, I've got one nuclear physicist that worked with me at Wilbur. And he stood there and he pointed at me. And I was doing a socio-economic job. And that's the point, really. We need to demythologize all this bit about working in industry. People can do it, provided they've got the right attitude. And attitude is fundamental to being employable. It doesn't matter what sort of bells and whistles you've got in terms of qualifications. If the attitude isn't right, if you haven't got the employability fundamentals of getting on with people, and we need to get those messages back to you. Now, Johan, you were talking about the challenge in finding uh, Welsh and UK suppliers for, for your project. And, you know, you touched on the fact that we don't have some of these skills. I mean, apparently, um, there's only two knife makers in the whole of the UK now, in terms of making a knife traditionally the proper way. And that's certainly the cost the, the energy industry, there's a lot of those sectors. Look at wind, onshore wind, the turbines can't be made in the UK, can they? So you've clearly been working on the ground, not can't in the future, can't at this moment. Um, you've been working on the ground looking at, at what's there. Um, how much of a challenge is it going to be to try and encourage people to learn the skills quickly for all of your industries, or even to relocate, come back to Wales, or come to Wales for the first time? Well, I think our, our challenge and opportunity is slightly different. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've been working for about two years to understand what's out there and what isn't out there, but what is out there is a huge ambition by Welsh and UK companies to help Wales become a global leader. And there's a huge determination. Um, some companies actually telling me we're happy to do the first first one at cost, and then subsequent to that we'll be looking to make a profit. But as I suppose what we're offering and what we need is where Swansea is is relatively small. That gives us an opportunity, as John mentioned, we behind the curve. We certainly behind the curve in Swansea. Given that every other lagoon is a lot bigger, it will give us a stepping stone to achieving the level of people with those skills that we need. I did mention in the, in the presentation that due to peak construction, we will need 70,000 people. And within the supply chain, there are, we are told, 36, was it 38,000 jobs. So we're certainly behind the curve now, but to enable us to get ahead of the curve, curve we, we need to understand what those skill sets are we need, and then very quickly with with the institutions, not only in terms of, of upskilling <coughs> people, but retraining some of those and upskilling some of those currently in employment. Currently, some of those currently unemployed, and yes, I hope we can bring a number of people back from offshore or Australia or Dubai. I'm not sure of the chief exec told me about three years ago, I don't want you to measure how many people uh, live locally. He said, I want you to measure the number of people that go home at night. It's a very, very different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's interesting that you've had a positive response when you said to companies from outside here, we want you to have this element from, uh, of your expenditure in Wales. We want you to have... Uh, Welsh company or Welsh individuals involved. And you seem to have had a positive example of that. So that that's good news for you then, Mark, isn't it? It is. Because in a way, you're, you're as you're almost saying, you're slightly behind on the tracks on that side of it. 
So is the, the challenge for you, presumably, um, which some people in this room might be asking, is the way that you award the contracts, how big you make your contracts as you go through, through your stages, will also make it more accessible or not to Welsh firms? Yes, and I, I think it was very interesting actually listening to, to the presentation and, and I also picked up on the number of wellness you need and I was thinking, well, one of the scarcity areas in our build as well is going to be welders. How many do you need? Do you know? Well, I, I don't know. It's, it's probably it's probably even more than that actually. But it, it's um, it is a very good opportunity, and you know that is that is a skill which is a skill for life and is very well paid. I think as you, you make the point. And at Colic Manor Manor at Tangethi, there's there's a, a welding centre which is just waiting to go. I think you know the the training facility is already starting to be in place. Um, the transferability, once again, of skills between projects is going to be very, a very interesting balancing act in the next 15 years, not just in Wales, but across the whole of the UK. Um, if you consider the, the number and the range of large infrastructure projects that are due to be built in the next 15 years, there are a lot of them, and not just in the energy sector. And, and these are often big construction projects. Um, because we don't have a, a centrally planned electricity industry now, um, we have the prospect of possibly having two other nuclear new builds in other parts of the UK, almost at the same time as Wilf and Newark. Uh, and that's, that's, that, a, that's a challenge for you, that, that is a big challenge for us. And, and <coughs> so uh, we, we very much hope that the, the lagoons and, and the resource there could be built and then transferred, if you like, into the... <laughs> the nuclear new build workforce, because if we're trying to do it all at the same time, uh, it's going to get very, very difficult, very difficult. But I think the 2020s, or between now and the 2020s, is going to be a very interesting time. Well, let's have a pause now. You probably can smell the coffee, and there's cakes as well at the back. So we've been looking at the demand, if you like, and I think we're all a bit daunted by the level of the demand. And we're going to have a coffee and a bit of time to soak in what we've already heard, and then we'll be back in about 15 minutes to, to look at the supply side. Thank you very much.
Last call, ladies and gentlemen, please. Last call. drafting frameworks to deliver digital competency. No one yet, as far as I'm aware, has actually defined what we mean by digital competency. Unless we know what it is we're looking for, how do we know whether we're achieving it? Many of the changes within the education system at the moment have been referred to briefly this morning. Changes to the Welsh Baccalaureate. Changes arising from the Donaldson report, looking at the whole process of education from 3 to 16. The new GCSEs 
that will soon be delivered within our schools and be assessed in 2017. The PISA style focus, everyone's heard about PISA I'm sure, and that focus on learning to learn, that focus on problem solving. The change, thankfully, from a very, very narrow focus in terms of secondary schools on what's been referred to as the level two plus, the number of youngsters achieving qualifications at GCSE level, at least five of them within English, Maths or Welsh. And that changed now, no wonder we've got a big focus on STEM, when science was never part of the main indicator by which schools were judged for many, many years. So we've got a huge number of changes, hopefully all moving in the right direction, but nevertheless putting additional strain on the schools in our system, who, like the rest of us, are coping and grappling with diminishing resources. Less funding, less teachers, less support staff. We are very fortunate in this region that we have, for the number of years now, had a very successful, very proactive, and very effective regional 14 to 19 network arrangement. And that is going from strength to strength. We're now in the second or third year of having a regional uh, programme for delivery of skills at 14 to 19. And that has recently been strengthened by our links with the regional service where that's uh, supporting our schools in terms of the developments that youngsters need. So for me, the challenges ahead are still there. Some of them are at the highest level and some are some of the detail where the devil uh, always appears. <coughs> Supply and demand, I was so pleased to hear uh, Dr. Garthai Jones mentioned this morning about the project that Welsh Government are engaged in, in identifying that skills gap. Unless we know what it is, how can we begin to address it? There's a real unintended consequence, I fear, on our immediate horizon. There was talk this morning about work experience placements between schools and, and organisations and, and, and workplaces. And we know that changes in that area in terms of responsibility for carrying out the health and safety checks is going to cause an additional problem, an additional challenge and ultimately uh, inevitably a barrier for many of our schools to engage uh, in that process. We've just heard very recently the Education Minister's announcement about global futures and the dreadful situation as far as I'm concerned in the uptake of modern foreign languages in our schools and the implication that has for many of us in terms of their workplace and their, their life skills. And the final point, something that uh, John Andrews Jones referred to and I very much uh, support is the biggest challenge perhaps is that of parents' perception and parents' perception for why some progression routes that we would wish our young people to follow are not being supported by their parents who don't believe them to be as appropriate or beneficial or to have the same kind of kudos. So some significant challenges ahead, but hopefully lots of really good positive developments on the way that we need to put our shoulders behind so we can continue to move in the right direction. on the role of the further education sector here and its links both current and future to the energy sector and beyond. Uh, the first of these two speakers is David Jones, who's Chief Executive of Colleg Cambria, who some of you may recall was our host for the Skills Summit in Manufacturing in November. Um, now if you give me some handy hints, some handy facts on you, David. Uh, you may not know that David has two interesting facts to share. I'm sure you have more than those. And you started your career in electronics uh, and electronics manufacturing industry and in recent years has championed fundraising at the college and you've raised more than £350,000. Excellent. So you completely understand the education uh, and, and industry link. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to David Jones. I'll be, I'll be very brief. 
I've, I've came here this morning to listen and it's been very, very interesting and I, I look forward to, to listening to the rest of the session as well. The, the clear message is that we have to match supply and demand. What does that mean? It means the nature of what we offer as people in education, what we offer, the scope, how much we offer different products. I think we've got a major problem here. We certainly haven't got enough welders, have we? Uh, quality, how well we do it, does it give business what it wants? And the little reality of money, we're going to have to do it cheaper as well. And that's the challenge, matching supply and demand. Now, I'm at the Caribbean College here, and I think it's fair to say over the last 10 years or so, the two best colleges in Wales are colleague Luke Hendricks on Menai and colleague Canberra. We've come through various manifestations to get to where we're at, but we can prove that North Wales has the two best colleges. But I'm not here to pat Glyn Jones or myself on the back, to be honest, because being the best in Wales simply isn't good enough. And it doesn't mean that what we do is what business wants. So we've got to look beyond and change what we do. If you look at North Wales, and if you also look at Glyndwr University, where 43% of provision is sub-degree, if you look at what that means in monetary terms, combined with Group Club for Menai and Colin Cumbria, we spend £150 million pounds each year on provision up to level four. So that means the normal sort of FE stuff and into foundation degree level. Now, I know we're in a time of austerity, but I think if, if we are hoping that across the horizon over there, Judy James or Hugh Lewis are going to come with buckets full of money for us to deliver this thing, um, it's not going to happen, is it? And I think we need to be looking at better ways to deploy that £150 million. It doesn't mean that we say to Cardiff, don't worry, we've got enough money. I'm not saying that, but we do have to take on board what uh, Rachel, sorry, John said about employers making a contribution and also about uh, co-investment. We certainly have got to, uh, we've got to improve our offer, look at what we do. I think as colleges, we are too uh, led by, what, um, by the targets we've got and sometimes what the students want to do. That might seem like being very customer focused, but this customer is having their education paid for by the state, and the state needs to deliver a strong economy. And certainly from my own college's point of view, we've got far many, too many people doing hairdressing, animal care, and other things. They are not the top strategic drivers for North Wales, but we need to work with government to get a transition, a very quick transition, so that we are offering more of the courses in the right areas. I think in terms of the school sector, and we were chatting about this over, over coffee just now, and I'm very clear, the old thing about tertiary education has to come back again. I'm afraid we are losing, we are letting down so many young people throughout schools who are going into sixth forms and are doing courses which do not fit with bright futures and do not fit with the uh, priorities for North Wales. And I think we need more tertiary centres. I'm pleased we're building a new tertiary centre in Flintshire at the moment, but we need more of them right across North Wales. Sixth forms are great, but I'm afraid much of what they're delivering isn't what this economy needs and what our futures demand if we're going to get a good share of, of the opportunities that are out there. So, uh, I do think we've got the foundations in the colleges. Um, I think a lot of what I've heard this morning in terms of what are the skills requirements, not all of it is specialised, quite a bit of it isn't specialised. What we need is more engineers, more people doing construction, more people doing science, more people getting into IT, more people getting into business and management and using them, developing ourselves, becoming more flexible, and growing in the areas that matter, and delivering quality. Last two quick messages from me. Um, the big mistake we could do in North Wales with all of this going on is to be parochial. And my God, we're good at being parochial. Really, really good at that. If we think we can meet the needs of Horizon or anybody else by delivering it in Llangevny, or in Anglesey, or in North West Wales, no chance. The bottom line, this is a massive project. It scares the hell out of me listening to the numbers, to be honest. But we need to work together, and certainly if I look at something like Johnny Driss Jones, I'm trying not to look right, I'm listening to the instructions, yeah? Uh, but one of the other things I do is chair an enterprise zone in D side, an advanced manufacturing enterprise zone. John chairs an enterprise zone in Charles Thunir, and also a colleague um, chairs the enterprise zone in Anglesey, where Glyn Jones is a member. Those enterprise zones could be the real foundation of the future, working together, a Team North Wales approach that can develop, deliver and actually really tap into the massive opportunities but challenges that we're facing as a result of these unprecedented opportunities. Just Mario. Actually, there are a few points there that I'm sure we'll want to uh, bring up in our question and answers um, bit. So 
David, thank you very much. Um, I'd like now to move <coughs> forward and continue looking at uh, the support from further education in North Wales. And we should remember that all of our education partners are increasingly working together, as we were just hearing there, both formally and informally. It's not competition. We need to work together to get the best that we can for our economy. And they're doing that to support the skills demands, both current skills demands and these ones that we're hearing in the future. So I would like to welcome today's host, Jean Jones from Group Thunderflow uh, Menai, to come and join us on uh, the platform here and give us your perspective. Thank you. So, how to meet this challenge? How to take this opportunity that we're presenting here in North Wales? Well, in our opinion, uh, some things are essential for delivering the skills supply and working successfully with employers, and we've tried to channel those into some goals for ourselves as an organisation. So, we're really committed uh, to the highest quality. We're committed to working very focused, in a very focused way with employers. We're very focused on health and safety, and we believe that we've got an enormous challenge now to invest in our staff in order to be able to uh, meet these challenges that confront us. So, I was looking uh, recently at engineering and construction in particular uh, in, this, in this college, and I know my two programme managers from both those areas are, are here this morning. Just under 1,000 learners leave this college every year with engineering or construction qualifications or experiences. And all of them currently go into the local employment market here in North Wales, I should say the regional employment market in North Wales. So our real dilemma, and I'm not even going to mention the other uh, subject areas that John Edris Jones was uh, referring to earlier, our real dilemma is how to increase that capacity, especially in those two areas. And we've got to increase them dramatically over the next few years. Currently, our focus is very much on the energy sector. We're now working uh, with the wind um, sector in particular, and also with domestic renewables installation and service of a number of renewable energy areas. But we can see coming towards us like an enormous, uh, like an enormous tidal wave, the tidal project, but also more imminently the nuclear project here in North Wales. And we believe that with partners in the university sector and obviously a, a, a <coughs> across the College Cambria, that we've got to work very much together to try and address that. Because as I said earlier on, our challenge is really one of capacity. Now at, at the minute, we have got some very strong industry partnerships with Hitachi and Horizon. We're talking with them on a regular basis about their skills requirements. We have Magnox co-located on our Tangevini site. We work with Siemens, RWE, the pioneer the turbine um, maintenance apprenticeship scheme with them. We have a heavy plant centre over at Tangevini where we're working with the National Construction College and Scottish Power to deliver uh, the, the heavy plant skills that are going to be required in the construction phase of, of, of the World and Airways project. And we're also piloting a higher apprenticeship engineering pilot and we have six knowledge transfer partnerships with local employers as well. Our ambition then, as a college in this region, is very much to be the partner of choice for training and recruitment for these new industries. We know that we're going to have to work in partnership with other organisations, specifically Cambria, the university sector in North Wales, to be able to respond adequately to that need. But we've already got some exciting developments afoot. There's the new energy centre at Tangevni. We have construction available at four locations in North West Wales. We have the co-location of the Magnox Learning and Development Team in Tangevni already. We have the MBEC centre over here focusing on the renewable industry. A £12 million work-based learning contract, which we're really trying to focus more and more uh, away from, um, towards, sorry, I should say, towards the engineering construction areas. And we have a very strong reputation for engineering experts. 
on the wind turbine side, um, a very successful project, a good example of a very close relationship uh, with, with the business. Um, you can see the wind turbine apprentices around here in their RWE livery, um, and they have opened our eyes really to what industry needs in these specific areas are, and we need to do more of that as time goes by. Our ambition in Anglesey is to establish an energy, energy skills park at our Tangevni site, where there will be a core provision of mechanical engineering, simula simulation, heavy electrical training, heavy welding, and people are glad to hear that we are focusing on the welding skills, skills, skill set, steel erection, heavy plant training, and the nuclear skills and engineering facility, which is approved by the Nuclear Skills Academy. Focusing <coughs> in three key areas, the human behavior is required to work in a health, healthy and safe manner in that kind of industry, instrumentation and control, and operations and maintenance. The businesses that we know more about at the moment are, in particular, Hitachi and Horizon. We're learning more and more about the nature and scale of their skills requirements, and as David said earlier on, it is a frightening prospect. We hope that we're going to be able to respond in a meaningful way to all of that, and we do feel that an integrated planning and delivery solution is required, where we have mechanisms for sitting down with these employers on a regular basis and making sure that we understand exactly what they want, when they want it, and to what scale. And we are then going to have to work with partnerships. I'm glad David mentioned the word partnership because it's very clear to us that we're not going to be able to respond to all this requirement as one organisation. We need to work together to be able to meet this demand. We're making a good start. Colin Cambria leading at the moment on an enterprise zone skills project which will attract around £20 million of European funding into North West Wales and North East Wales over the next five years. And we see that that will be a vital component in supporting the skills developments. There are also some interesting structure developments going on currently with the skills group led by John Ingus Jones being formed and the Welsh Government's own energy board which is channeling uh, the energies of the Welsh Government as well towards responding to this need. So although concerned about the scale of the challenge, I am, I am confident that we're moving in the right kind of direction and I'm really looking forward to the next few years and how we can respond uh, to these industries. Thank you very much, Dean. It's really interesting uh, to hear what is already being done from, uh, from your part in terms of uh, uh, trying to uh, provide the supplies and the vision, the supplier skills provision, and what you're already achieving. So I think, you know, as we're hearing more and more speakers, I'm sure you have questions coming up in your mind. What we're going to do is we're going to, when we finish talking about the supply side, we're going to have question and answers on that. And then we're going to have a final question and answer session where we'll be inviting some of our employers to come back as well, uh, along with Welsh Government, so you have the opportunity to talk about skills generally uh, in our final panel. But before we do that, I'd like to move on to the, another stage of education, if you like, higher education. And I'm happy to say that we have representatives from both universities uh, here in North Wales with us this morning. First of all, I'd like to welcome from Bangor University, Trevor Jones. Let <laughs> uh, uh, me just click through Glenn's slides. <laughs> I need my props, so I'm not going to do this without being able to see what I'm looking at. Um, very briefly, uh, what I'm going to do today is just look at some very practical measures that we have got to respond to demand side. And uh, it's just going to be about putting markers down. I've got a number of colleagues here. Uh, I've got a number of colleagues here from Bangor uh, who you can talk to over lunch. Uh, I was going to start by telling you what I was going to tell you about, but you can see that on the screen, so I'll, I'll just move on. The first thing I just want to say a couple of words about is our approach to working with business. Working with business is of vital importance to us as a university for many, many reasons. You know, we now have to deliver socio-economic and societal impact to actually justify our funding and our existence. 
We need businesses to enhance the employability of our students and to work with our students. And there are many, many funding streams for skills development and R&D that we can only access by working with you as businesses. So that, that's vital. To try and help businesses better understand us, we've reformatted and introduced a whole new bit of our website recently called Working With Business. And this really responds to our customers' problems that they were having real difficulties finding our offer that tended to be buried in various bits of schools and departmental websites. So it's all there now under Working With Business with one link from the first Front University page. There are six different blocks there, and behind those blocks, there we go. Behind each of those blocks, there are hot links to the programs and the projects that can help you. And on each one of those front pages, you'll find a named individual. The example there is for accessing knowledge and expertise. That's got my name on it, that's got my phone number on it, that's got my email address on it and the same for the other six areas that we're interacting with business. So if you can't find something or just even can't be bothered looking, give us a call and we'll, uh, and we'll, we'll do that for you. Secondly, I just wanted to say a few words then about R&D skills for graduates and for industry. Um, our first real response, I guess, to Anglesey Energy Island and Gwynedd Wereth, which we were working with at the time, was to just try and map and take stock of what we had to offer. And I really don't expect people to see what's in those blocks and the boxes, but it's just to give an idea of scale and diversity of our ecosystem. And those blocks are grouped around expertise in things like generation, greenhouse gas management, education and training, and also energy efficiency, taking into account things like the behavioural science and the behaviour change involved in, in those sorts of activities. Now, behind each one of those coloured boxes, we think we've got something to offer to industry and other businesses, other organisations involved in the discussion. And I just want to now click very quickly through a few of these, which I think will persist into the future or even if projects are um, uh, coming to an end as part of the end of structural funding, where we'll have the kits, the people, the expertise will still be in Bangor to offer those high-level skills. I think the first one of those, probably very, very familiar to you, is the CCAMS project, where we can offer higher-level skills on collaborative R&D for the marine <coughs> sector. And CCAMS, we are very confident, will persist um, into the 2014-2020 uh, European programme. Moving on quickly, if you're into biomass, I'm sure many of you will be aware of Beacon, which again, we're very confident, along with other uh, for, um, higher education partners, uh, uh, is also going to persist into the future. Beacon is about anything to do with biomass, biotechnology, pelletisation, biorefining, but also many other bio-based applications for materials, pharmaceutical industries. So Beacon will live on and will still be there to deliver higher level skills. In the optoelectronics and uh, solar photovoltaic industry, we're currently running a project known as Claret, an Academia for Business uh, Skills and Research project. Claret may not live on as Claret, but in association with uh, Glyndor, Swansea may well live on in, uh, in the future with those capabilities. Hydro BTP, we've got something for everything. This is a, a fairly novel project. Not moved. No, oops. Fairly novel project looking at using micro turbines in supply pipes uh, in order to generate energy. And then I really just got to put markers down before fairly uh, important other <coughs> projects. The CARES uh, Economy Skill Scholarships. CARES will actually be relaunched for another seven years, and we can put PhD students and research master students into businesses and organisations to help you with business issues and business problems with their academic supervisors 
they will get a research master's or a PhD out of that process. You will get an academic and usually a very highly qualified postgraduate student to help you with your problems. John, I think, has already mentioned Menai Science Park. Menai Science Park will be our focus on Anglesey, Hemspark, for supporting energy-based industries that want to move and grow, also an element of digital. But the Menai Science Park guys are developing a specialist research master's uh, program to put master's students into businesses. <laughs> Management and leadership skills, absolutely vital, not just to the energy industry. So we're very, very pleased and very confident that the LEAD program, you may be aware of LEAD, LEAD will again move on and persist over the next uh, round of funding, delivering leadership and management skills. And we ourselves in uh, joint venture and in, in partnership with Andrew from Menai, through our management centre at Bangor, uh, uh, provide a whole host of skills for management and leadership. Quickly then, graduates for the energy sector. All those sort of specialist programs are coming out of schools and colleges, but they're also delivering graduates and postgraduates in things like chemistry, electronic engineering, computer science. And I think worthy of mention and of note is sort of one of our regional responses is to introduce a four-year Masters in Engineering uh, degree in Control and Instrumentation Engineering, which is of very, very high priority for the industry. But also we've got a four-year Masters in uh, Critical Safety Engineering. Alongside the sort of higher level technical skills, I think we've heard mention, you know, environmental science, geography, land use planning, business and finance, all of these actually were graduate opportunities that were advertised by Horizon in their first round of graduate opportunities. Um, and we're delighted actually that one of our environmental science undergraduates have got one of those first four long-term Horizon opportunities. So as John says, it's not about the people nuclear physicists. You know, there are a lot of high quality jobs there that Bangor has got a track record in delivering. But what we really need for these students are opportunities to get them out into business and into your organisations on placements, study placements, work placements, internships, so that we can actually give them the softer employability skills alongside those technical skills. And um, Alex Charlie is here from our career service. If anybody has got opportunities, ideas, where we can start preparing our students to use their technical skills alongside those employability skills. We'd be absolutely delighted to hear from you. You had asked me to just say a quick word about our MOU and our work with Horizon. You may be aware we've signed a memorandum of understanding with Horizon Nuclear Power back in January, and we are looking to collaborate with Horizon on employability, uh, collaboration for research uh, infrastructure that meets all our needs, but also, again, the important aspect of promoting and managing uh, STEM. We're also providing the members for National Skills Academy Nuclear, and uh, we've had huge value from working with Alison and her colleagues at NSAN, not just in the intelligence and information uh, to prepare and plan, but Alison has been fantastic in working with our students as part of our Bangor Employability Awards around softer skills uh, to, to help them be prepared for the world of work. Finally, very quick trot through what we're up to and what's on the horizon. Uh, we are running a number of awareness raising events for our students and for our staff on opportunities and the sorts of qualifications our students need. To, to, to work in the industry. Uh, in association with U1 and the North Wales Economic Ambition Board, we bought companies like RWE Renewable, Scottish Power, Centrica, Ramble, National Grid onto campus to work with our students. We've recently held a very well attended event with Horizon, NSAN, Nuclear Grads to specifically look at nuclear skills. Uh, we're working with National Skills Academy Nuclear actually it's quite innovative to map onto 
uh, competency frameworks for the industry, where within our curriculum we are delivering those skills. So our students know when they go into interview that as part of their academic studies they can say, we've done this, this and this that fits in with the in industry competency frameworks. We're exploring where we're putting our strategic capital investment and things like control and instrumentation engineering at the very highest level is an obvious candidate. But we're also talking to much more specialist providers like the Bolton D. Clear Institute, like Birmingham, both I think have got MOUs with Verizon themselves, I think, haven't they, Mark? How we can work with them to bring their staff in to nuclearize bits of our curriculum where we haven't quite got those specialist skills ourselves. Alongside working with those other providers, we're also looking to work far, far more closely with uh, Group Andrew for Menai. We've had very early discussions about how we can work in partnership to deliver across the skills continuum for the industry. But we're also encouraging our staff and our students to attend the Country for Menai triple bar courses, for example, uh, for, uh, they, they provide for MSAM. Uh, finally, we're taking that more strategic um, joined up approach to STEM. You know, we, we run a number of programmes. We've got colleagues here today, Catherine from Provi, if any of us talk about Provi, I've seen Ian, Paula, Delif from Reaching Wider. So we're looking to work on that STEM outreach with Verizon in a far more coordinated way. But also we're looking at how we can use our research skills to maybe evaluate and monitor whether those programmes are working and whether or not those programmes need to change and the monitoring regimes need to change. I'll shut up at that point, other than to say we do have a monthly electronic newsletter and I'll leave some cards somewhere obvious. I guess the buffet is probably the best bet for somewhere obvious uh, in, in, in the near future. And if anybody wants to fill them in and let us have them back, then we can let them have our monthly newsletter and what we've got coming up in the month. Sorry, you that was a bit long. They were just markers, there's an awful lot of detail behind there. Okay, thanks. chambers, so much better throughput of mass production of solar panels. Top right, you have the big solar wall at the Sadasa Research Centre Optic. Bottom right, you have the BRIAM Excellent uh, Centre for Creative Industries at Wrexham uh, campus with the solar panels on the front and uh, grass on the roof so it doesn't absorb any energy anyway. 
Right, next, uh, carbon fiber, we're very big in this. The leading person here is Professor Richard Day, who's been awarded a UK National EPSRC Fellowship to work with the uh, catapult centers for advanced manufacturing. Um, clearly, uh, very rather the aerospace industry and wind turbines, uh, his major research effort is on rapid processing of large structures using microwaves. Okay, let's roll on from that. Gas turbines. We've got next Rolls Royce professor Alison McMillan helping to restore the gender balance in engineering. Um, so she's very interested in 3D printing of the high stress components in the gas turbines. Also, we have several staff active in thermofluids and computational fluid dynamics relevant to turbines of all types wind, water, gas, steam. Um, quickly turn my page here and uh, yeah we have a gas turbine in the university non-working uh, we could take the students to see a working one in the centre in South Wales if necessary South West Wales um, smart grid what am I doing there we go probably doing two okay smart grid is very important uh, really need to have students heads around this it could change the whole picture quite radically it's to do with distributed energy storage which is coming by leaps and bounds people's cars can represent stochastically distributed energy storage greatly change the situation smart grid is much more than just a fancy meter changing the way your electricity is charged it can turn the whole industry upside down and students need to be on top of that uh, probably would be based on a market-based algorithm very rapidly swapping for the cheapest electricity. Uh, this is relevant to energy storage, big energy storage. Um, I'll pop back to that at the end, but I'm the person to talk to about that. Uh, oh yes, we, so we have experts on batteries, lithium-ion batteries, and we've done work on advanced flywheels for energy storage. That pretty picture is a simulation of the stresses in a carbon fiber flywheel designed to spin at very high speeds and store energy in a very clean way. Uh, fusion power, we have a stake in that, a bit futuristic, but our work on polishing mirrors for the European Extremely Large Telescope is quite well known and the same technology can be used to polish mirrors to focus laser beams for a laser confinement uh, fusion power. That's a little bit futuristic, but it might take off and again change the whole picture. Uh, oh, pretty picture of a mirror polishing facility, right. Um, so, um, electrical engineering laboratories, a big laboratory on control of distributed systems using programmable automation controllers. Um, electrical machines laboratory run by one of our Russian <coughs> colleagues, a word about Russia in a minute. Uh, renewable energy programs, very significant. Um, so we are, we've just recruited a new lecturer with nuclear skills and we're joining the National Skills Academy for Nuclear. Uh, we're also investing heavily in rail, which may be relevant to re lower energy demand in transportation. Um, and finally, some words about partners. Um, anyone here from Park Agua, Wheel Operator? No, uh, well, that's the waste recovery thing uh, on D side that's going to burn uh, waste rubbish and make extra energy. That's quite relevant. It's all part of the story. Uh, perhaps they should have been represented. Wrexham Power. Anyone here from Wrexham Power? My goodness. Uh, so this is a gas uh, turbine station that's supposed to be built on the uh, Wrexham Industrial Estate. Uh, Techni is a wind power company uh, that we've worked with in the past. Uh, Quarry Battery or Snowdenny Hydro. Is there anyone from those? Uh, well, that's very important. Quarry Battery is uh, a company that's proposing to create a copy of the Dinorwick uh, pump storage facility, but at the Glen Ronley Quarry on the south side of Glen Padon. And uh, energy storage is absolutely critical. Incidentally, to our friend from uh, Swansea Tidal Lagoon, um, I wouldn't mess with the Swansea people. They're just going to, where is he? They're just, he's gone. Oh. Oh, well, the Swansea people are just going to mess him about with their oyster beds. You should do it in Colwyn Bay because, as you heard, it's a tidal thing. It produces surges of power in the daytime with gaps. To fill those gaps, you need the energy storage, which we've got at Dinorwick and potentially at Glen Ronwy. So it'd be far better if he focused on Colwyn Bay. I was hoping he'd be here to clear that one. Um, 
Okay. Now, the, now then, uh, at the bottom you see our friends in Russia. Now, you sharp intake of breath when you talk about Russia. We had long, long-standing links with Russia, and we had sharp intakes of breath as well. We've debated what to do about them because we're very upset about the politics, but we think it's right to keep working with them. Just as people said in the old days of apartheid in South Africa, Georgia was better than World War. And the people at the, at the coalface are perfectly good, and there's really solid energy experience there, and they're good people to work with. So uh, we have very strong links at the highest level there with some top universities. <coughs> okay, uh, a few other generalities I wanted to talk about. Uh, okay, so we have Technicwest Lindor on our site, which is very important in getting interest from school children and if you want to increase, someone said the uh, penetration of STEM in the schools is very poor. If you want to increase STEM penetration in the schools you need to get accredited as a STEM ambassador and get one of these horrible triangular <laughs> badges. I don't like wearing it because it looks as though it's, uh, I am a, a, a member of the Total Around Preservation Society. <laughs> like but uh, it is a good scheme to get STEM expertise out into the schools. Um, just uh, talking about collaboration between FE and HE. Um, I, I came to uh, Glyndor from an old established university. I really uh, think that there, there's too much snobbery in the old universities. We have a very good program at Glyndor, bringing on, starting with the water industry, bringing on uh, mostly males, regrettably, who left school early and uh, didn't have a lot of motivation. They realized they need to be upskilled. And, We've got people who've done a fantastic job of taking them right through to foundation degrees and honours degrees. And so uh, I'm against that snobbery agenda. It's one of the reasons I, I came to, uh, to North East Wales Institute as was. Um, I also, uh, uh, if I can say, on heavy hakos like our real trauma, which some of you will understand uh, if, if I don't. Um, Okay, and uh, I think just finally to say, I'm the Welsh representative of the Engineering, Engineering Professors Council, uh, that's the UK National Council of Expert Professors. Incidentally, a lot of women on that, a lot of women in leading positions in it. So we can we can and do more to get more women into engineering, and uh, it means that I am in touch with what's going on at the UK national level. Okay, thank you for listening. Go, go, go. <laughs>
if you like the building we run out with. But let's have a good picture. Let's be positive. Let's say there's going to be more things, other things in the pipeline moving forward. And let's not forget, there's going to be a thousand people at think, in the that we run out with anyway, so that's a positive position. Glenn, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, just add to that last point there. I think, um, in particular, um, there's an opportunity for the supply chain companies in this area to become part of a, of a, of a global supply chain because energy is a global industry. And uh, I, I recollect my time in the college previously, Pembrokeshire, uh, where there was a, a massive development in, in oil and uh, gas, energy gas, uh, both um, importing it, but also then uh, a, a new power station was built down there. And I, and I, I know for sure that three or four supply chain companies from Pembrokeshire developed their skills and their businesses to become suppliers to that industry globally as a result of that experience. So I think there are real opportunities of that sort for our smaller businesses too. And Trevor, you, you showed us some of the research that's being built up and being developed at your university and working with companies. Presumably, you would hope that after the big projects are just up and running and ticking over, other companies, spin-offs, other innovation will also have taken out as part of that process and could develop further, no? Yes, I think so. I think, I think there are three things. There's the innovation and spin-off that we can keep local. We're in maybe a slightly different position in that we operate in a very, very global market. We've got students who come to us from all over the world and take their training and skills away with them, sort of extending our reach and, and knowledge across the world of what we can offer. And actually, a lot of the intellectual property stuff uh, and things that are created can be marketed, exported, and globalised, as Glenn was saying. So if we become centres of excellence where we sell our services elsewhere, then that, that's great by us. And one final point, the third thing, procurement and working with SMEs to make SMEs more effective at competing. Um, we, we have a procurement unit, and one of the things they do uh, specialise in is that agglomeration of SME uh, ability to be able to compete and tender. So I think there's, there's, there's a range of things there that gives us resilience into the future. Now, I'm often um, criticised for being too much of an optimist by the colleagues that I work with. Um, Peter, isn't this also, in a way, a kind of all of this is a, an injection? into our economy, into our communities, that hopefully will continue beyond that. You know, we can, we can double up as a multiplier effect. It's certainly a short-term injection, and uh, clearly the construction industry is particularly uh, uh, risk of this problem of projects ending, so we have to look to other projects rolling out. As I said, we're investing in railways, and we think that's a, a big growth area. It is across the UK. Wales is lagging way behind, but it's uh, dreadful, North-South Railways in particular. But uh, we hope that there might be investment in something like that that will follow on. Uh, there's prisons. We hope we don't need do more than one of those. Um, but uh, the construction industry does have to be agile. And incidentally, there is a, a political point that I know the construction firms have been saying up here that they miss out on some of the projects because their parcel up is being so large that they can't tender for them. And then they just fall to uh, uh, English and international construction companies. And that's a major issue for Welsh politicians to address. And that's also true across the energy sector, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Um, any more questions quickly with this panel here? You could also talk over lunch, of course, but any, any others? No, in which case, let's thank this panel. Thank you.
the skills we're going to need, the skills we might not have, and there's a microphone we need down there for you. And I think we'll get everyone on the panel. We'll start, why don't we start from this end and we'll ask everyone on the panel to respond to your question. Thank you very much. Sasha Davis there at the Conway Council. I was just wondering, it's probably a question that I'm sure Mark will have most interest in, in terms of the Tier 1 contractor that GE Touch will be appointing later this year. But it really is about the local company's uh, involvement with that first tier contractor and in the way, again, that um, some, some of the elements of that huge contract will, will be packaged up. How can you secure that the maximum amount of um, clearly appropriate um, and qualified local companies involvement in these huge uh, bundles of contracts that will be coming through the T1 side of things. Okay, I will ask you to talk about that first, Mark, and then perhaps you, John. Mark. Okay. Um, I think we go back to where Hitachi took over Horizon. Um, one of the very first statements made by a very senior Hitachi executive, and this, this also reflects an agreement with the UK government, um, was that up to 60% of the value of the supply chain for Wilton New would, would go to the UK. Um, and that is a commitment. Um, you know, Japanese executives, Japanese companies tend to stand by their commitments as we are learning, working as a subsidiary of, of Hitachi. Um, and we will pass that on to the tier one contractor. So we will say to the tier one contractor, this is a, this is a commitment that's been made at a senior level we are expecting you to subcontract with that in mind. Now, what I would say is that if we're not applying quotas, um, and this applies also to employing individuals, we're not applying quotas to the region or to particular localities. It has to be done on merit. But every opportunity will be provided to local companies and regional companies to compete and to win the business. And I think we've reflected that already at the work that we've, we've already commissioned and has been carried out on site at Wilbur, um, where a lot of local companies have been involved and have done a very good job. So it's still very early days, but the, you know, the, the commitment is there to do it, the, the principle is there to do it. We will have to work with the tier one contractors to make sure they are aware of that requirement as part of the project and part of their commitment to the project. Mark, perhaps you could help us. How many contracts will there be? Because that's quite crucial, isn't it? Uh, I can't help you with that because I'm not a supply chain specialist and, and I would have to refer that back, actually. Right. But there will be hundreds of contracts. Because, in a way, the way that it's bundled affects the chance of Welsh companies being able to bid for it, yep. isn't it? Yeah, and, and that is outside of my domain. I can't answer that. I, I'm a, a learning development training person, not a supply chain person. Because, John, actually, the way that companies all these things together um, does have an impact in terms of what those people who are involved in the training world can deliver, doesn't it? It, it does indeed, and, and you know, we've got an example very locally to us in, in Wrexham now, to the North Wales Prison Development, and that principle that, that Matt just talked about it has very much been in place there, where there is a clear requirement and an expectation uh, upon the, the tier one contractors that they do subcontract locally, uh, and, and a I do believe, I may be talking about it, but I do believe that they have gone as far as um, specified quotas there as well in terms of local work. It is possible to do quotas for happening yeah. in Wales, isn't it? Yeah. It doesn't yes. have to be UK. And, and, no, no, that's right. In, in terms of Wales, in terms of the region, and in terms of you know, distance from the project itself. Um, Rachel, perhaps you could help us in terms of what government role there can or can't be. You know, often if things go wrong, we blame the government. You know, it's kind of the tradition, isn't it? Um, but how much, what can the government do to try and almost kind of broker the best benefit from Wales out of the companies? I think um, the Welsh government's been really focused on that, the issue of procurement contracts and trying to ensure that as much as possible we get the benefits for Welsh business. Um, finance Minister, for example, set up a, a task and finish going across Welsh government to get in departments and other costs. Just focus on that in terms of current and future procurement contracts, ensuring that businesses don't miss out and ensuring that we maximise trading opportunities. And I'm sure this is something we'll continue to work with, you know, our ambition board on. Um, I think there's some good example going on with the prison, for example, of trying to get a, a quota of, of, of trade places. Another example, I think the Owen is back here, is in terms of Tide Lagoon 
um, we've had a, a working group within government to look at this and work closely with the developers and again focused on the terms of title of view, making sure that Welsh businesses do benefit from that. Um, and I think we'll continue to work with Ambition Board to make sure wherever possible for these big developments that Welsh economy broadly but also businesses in the region do benefit and as well as the way people have an opportunity. I mean, Ian, from your perspective, what, what do you need the support with to be able to help bring forward change and help develop? Well, just quickly, go back quickly to what was being said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that, um, I think we do need to recognise, we've been an expert in energy, energy field, is that some aspects of the work is not available in, in, in Wales. So some specialities have got to come in from outside and how that's done to work careful. So how things are packaged is, is quite careful, is quite important. But I think the more general things, hopefully will be packaged in a way which does give lots of more local company access to those. I think another thing which is needed is, is go back to Mike's point, is that how the smaller companies are being prepared to enable them to bid for uh, work because I know that when, when the time comes and to do that, the requirements will be quite exacting uh, and there'll be lots of pre tendering <coughs> issues to go through that maybe some small companies aren't really aware of now. So I think that of awareness raising and working with those companies I think is essential. And I, I would say the sooner, I know some of it's going on, I think more needs to go on to be much more high profile, the sooner the better that happens. And what, what we, as Glenn was mentioning earlier, what, what we are doing now is, is trying to develop partnership work with a range of partners, be they from uh, private sector or public sector, from a delivery point of view, to make sure we can and do respond in, in a sensible uh, and an effective way to the requirements as they emerge. And uh, the sooner we can get that off the ground, the sooner we can get that running, I think the better for all of us. And who do you think should have the main responsibility for that awareness raising that you talk about? Um, I refer to Mark and, and, and colleagues in, in Horizon, of course. But, but I think what's really heartening about, about the, the Wilva development I, I refer to is what's emerging over the past months is very much a team Wales approach. You know, we've got government involved, we've got local authorities have been involved for, for a little while, and providers involved. I think there's a shared responsibility I think, for that, for that raising awareness. Um, but I think it's got to be driven by the, the main driver. I think is, is information from uh, Horizon, Hitachi, Tier One, etc. And then we all need to be ready because I, I, I describe our situation now is like not so much pushing water up a hill, but we're pushing a big rock up a hill. And I think we're getting pretty much close to the top of the hill now. And when that rock starts to roll the other side. We have to run very, very fast. So you know, we, we need to be a bit more ahead of the game in it. So we need to put all those places, things in now, and make sure we're ready. Another question? Any other questions? Yes, there you go. Jenny Edwards, Education Demonstration Council. Um, I work in the secondary sector, and it's about awareness raising. And I think one of the issues is, if I was a young person here today, I'd be totally confused about where do I stay on in school, do I not stay on in school, what are the routes available to me. Um, and I think possibly at the moment that there's this lack of a clear um, impartial careers guidance for young people in schools particularly from a very young age. I'm wondering whether the, you know, the panel would agree with that and whether they have any sort of suggestions as to how we can improve that. John, would you like to answer that? I'll, I'll try. I'll make a first attempt. At it. I, I, I do agree with, with the question uh, and the point that's being made because, unfortunately, you know, we have a system whereby the, uh, the funding that's available is very much driven by bums on seats. And let's be honest, you know, that does not encourage people to provide clear, impartial advice and guidance about where youngsters should go next for their learning. So there's very much a self-preservation element in there about institutions offering courses that will be attractive to youngsters because they know that will then generate their funding. So there's a real challenge for us there as an education system 
about securing that impartial uh, quality advice and guidance about future steps and programmes for learning. I think that there are um, some positive developments there in terms of the, the recent change in focus on progression and the link between progression and funding of places. But I think we've got a long way to go. Ian, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, I think this is a very, very relevant point because I have a great concern as someone who's worked in, in senior management in the school sector before moving to FE. One, one of the big things that has happened over the recent years, and I'm going to use them carefully, is the demise of Careers Wales. And Careers Wales, uh, Wales has, has been kicked around and pulled to bits for whatever reasons, but as a consequence then, we, we are getting a situation where youngsters aren't getting objective advice, uh, not from the teachers or not from the college who tend to knock the door to say something. And I think that's a big failing. And I think there's anything which could be done in the short term with Rachel to go back and talk to colleagues. I think that there may be, and it may be a short term thing, we need enhanced careers guidance for young people in North Wales to allow them uh, to make choices that will equip them to make the decisions which allow them to go into these, these opportunities in the future. And if there's one thing I'm not going to do, it would be that. Well, there we are. Thank you very much. <laughs> bring that session to a close. As I said, you know, you're not all running off immediately. There's lunch, so you've got lots of time to have that perhaps more one-to-one, -one, more intimate conversation with each other and with our speakers. I'd like to thank our panel very much.
ac hefo mix hwnna a gwrthwyrdded y dwi'n weld yn anodd. Mae dwi'n ei wneud i'n byd bod pwydo. Mae gen ni'n eithio bendig eich hyd yn dod allan wan o be mae'r chi dweisio yn edrych o. Dyn ni'n bod amdano o wan y carchar yn recsia. Lle mae hwnna wedi cochwyn o ne, lle arni gochwyn lle nhw ni ac arwyn oddi o'n eich yn siarad o'r Ministri o'r Benn. Jyst fel eich am bod wan. Dyna nhw'n sylwen o i be oed dwi eisrwydd yn gogledd yn rhaid. Lle da ni wedi dod i ble wan y gweithio o'r Ministri o'r Benn. Lle bod nhw wedi troi rownd a deisa ni y bydd yna i fyny i drian o'r gweithwyr yna yn fwy eithog i ateb gofynion cogled y carchar yng Ngogled Gymreig. Dyna ydy be yma dwy eich pyd gweithio yn mynd yn ei a ddod i ni. Mae gen ni'n gwybod bethau anhygoel yng Ngogled Gymreig yn achos y ni ydy ateb, y bwrdd eich helgais a gogled gymreig ydy ateb yn i'r Northern Powerhouse, yn ni'n clywed yn mynd amdano o, ni ydy yr ateb i'r City Region sy'n lawr yn deg yn rhaid. Mi feddwn ni'n neud gyslaid am hwn, achos da ni'n hynod o ffodus bod gen o'n i'n lywodraeth o fewn Cymru sydd yn fodlon gweithio hefo ni a gwrando ar yn anghenio ni. Doedd o ddim bai ar neb yn deg yn rhaid, a dydyn ni, os o'n ei reina ni'n tymor, bod ni heb gael digon yn y gorffennol, yn bai ni oedd o, bod ni'n mynd gweithio i'n gael cael ei gael o. Be da ni'n fedwn ni'n neud hwn, ydy codi yn gem ac yn neud yn siŵr bod ni yn galo. A mi fedra i ddau i dwi'n y bod yna'n gefnogaeth gyn yn eilodau cynulliad ni a gwynidogion i neud yn siŵr bod gyfleu cymryd i fy colli allan. Pan mae gen i chi'n gwybod ydyn ydyn? A chyffro fel si nawan. Mae hynny yn magu angen, passion at be da ni isio neud. A sas gen i ni hwnnw yn yn boliad was ni roi gorau di yn ddiannau yn gyn hwyr. Mae yna rei yn deud bod gen i fwy o le storio fo'n os gyrra fwy anach chi, ond dyna o mae ta'r gall chi hynny. Mae siw gen i na be da ni yn ddatblygu na dyna ni ddim gweud sy'n wedi cyrraedd eto ydy'r hyder yn gogledd Cymru yma yn medrwn i lwyddo. A mi ddim gogledd Cymru gysgod â unrhyw le arall. Mae gen i'r rhanbarth yma yn ymar ni, o'r bod bob peth mi fedwn ni'n gystadlu fel unrhyw rhanbarth arall yn ymar. Ac be sgynna ni hefyd ydy be yma gogledd Cymru yn medru ddod, trwy'r bydd sodiadau yma. Be da ni'n medru gael ydy digwyddiadau yma sydd yn dod â bobl yma i wario pres yn yr economi. Ac hynny yn rhan o'r chwyddiant. Hefyd, yn lle bod ni yn ddeud na, be sgynna ni angen neu, a bod â chwysig ydy ffindio ffordd i ddeud i iaith. Ac yna ni yn gwella yn hynny o beth. Mae gen i ein rhifftiad da hynny yn Sir Conwyd, lle gwrach y bas yna amalun wedi cael ofn ar be da ni'n neud. Ond be da ni wedi bod yn fedr mynol o wneud ydy bod ni'n ffeindio ffordd i ddau dia, a mae'r un i'n agwedd yn datblygu trwy gogledd Cymru hefo ar Economics and Business Board, a pawb sydd yn rhan o hynny o. Mi faswn i yn meddwl yn ymlaen am yn hir, ond byw mi'n ei gael ffrae gyn hwy, a sgynna i'n eisiau hynny. Ond, mi awn i'n mae, be, er hynny'n gwestiwn sy'n eisiau hynny'n fan mawr o'n ddi? Pan bod y bobl ma'n eisiau hynny'n solli yng Ngogledd Gymru? Why do people want to invest here? Because they see it as a good place to invest, somewhere that's going to be worth investing in. They admire the people and the way we run our business here, and also, Last but not least, it, where better could you have to, uh, to set up a, biscuit, a business where people can enjoy the surroundings and everything like that? Don't look at it as a threat if there are people coming in. Uh, some people will look at it as a threat to the language and the culture. I don't look at it in that way. Let's look at it and concentrate on how this can increase the use of the Welsh language of bilingualism in North Wales and also the, how we can enhance our culture. Because don't forget, these people have chosen to invest in North Wales because of North Wales as it is, not because of what North Wales could turn out to be if it changes. So we have to look after what, we, uh, what we've already got. So I think that with all this investment and the economy increasing 
that we'll have more people being be bilingual, speaking Welsh and English fluently in North Wales for the future. As I said before, don't say no, find a way to say yes. And uh, uh, development doesn't have to be a threat to anybody. Make sure that you find a way of making the investment into something positive. Education. We, I, I heard it mentioned now that our young people went away. Well, we've already started on this through the economic service involved, working with the autonomous and the uh, colleges and what have you, is sharing with our education departments within local authorities as to how we can work with our secondary schools first, then down to the primary schools, of instead of what's been happening in the past, where our, um, our office has been uh, looking at exam results and saying, telling our young people, you should go in for this or that as a career. What, we, what I think we should be doing now is trying to identify what is going to be available in North Wales for the next 10, 20 and 30 years and let them choose and, uh, and steer the education uh, accordingly. And we've already done that, uh, doing that, more work to be done, but uh, uh, certainly it's gone down well and there's a lot of enthusiasm in doing that. Uh, yes, our young people, they, they're the future, we have to look after them, but let's not forget either, we've heard about engineering and welding skills, and I will stop now before anybody starts to in a bit, um, and uh, what we mustn't forget as well, that we've got a lot of expertise in North Wales. I can think of, from the top of my head now, at least six businesses and individuals within my own ward, where I represent, who could cope with any welding or engineering job. They might not have a, a roll of letters after their names, they might not have certificates, but test them and check their work out, they're as good as you'll get anywhere. But what we have to make sure is, in these one man, with these one-man band businesses, like has been mentioned, that we give them support if some of those skills are transferred to places like Will that be, that we can support those businesses to fill the gap for X amount of years. And we are identifying problems like that now through the Economic Commission's board, and uh, it will, you know, we'll do what we can to support it. Can I thank Collect and Stop? once again, for letting us use this excellent facility for the work they do. I want to give a personal thank to further education and higher education in North Wales for their support and their enthusiasm for the future. We are now being talked about in South Wales as to what we're doing. I hear this through leaders meeting across Wales. We are no longer the poor relations. In no time, if we keep on going the pace we're going, they'll be uh, looking to catch up with us. And that is my ambition for North Wales. Firstly, enjoy your lunch. When you have a fifth year, you can go bobby the land. It's going to go back to your mama. The other thing you need to do is to make it heavy and go not to have any down. Or it's going to be white from blue now. And be on your neck and I'll see you still out of the land. And you can see that you can see that and he does them best. We only best half this and the blue dinner in the summer. Get for help again.